Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, so session number two, news again. It's really great honor and privilege for me to co-chair this session with Professor George Dangas, a really supporter of the club and long-lasting friend, and our connection with Sky, TCT, and everything on the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, and then we have great uh, panelists also here. So. Uh, one info for all presenters, please try to stay with time, otherwise we will not have time for discussion. So uh, let's start with the first presentation, Dr. Mitomo. KBT or not KBT, that is the question. Thank you so much for chairman and good morning everyone. I'm very honored to be here we, as a uh, presenter for this wonderful session. Today I'd like to talk about uh, this topic after stenting, uh, single crossover stenting, is routing KBT always necessary? Before starting the topic, let me summarize briefly what we know from our data meter registry. If we can take a single st uh, stent strategy, the clinical outcome would be much better Circumflex ostium itself might be independently associated with a high risk stenosis rate. So let me PCR result could be hampered with a high risk stenosis rate in the circumflex ostium. However, the incidence may, be, may not be directly, directly associated with fatal prognosis. So after single crossover stenting, what is the most important technique? Pot, quality of KBT, or even a KBT or not KBT? Let's talk about the uh, importance of the pot. As we know well, the pot is uh, one of the predictors uh, to reduce uh, the resonosis after recommend PCI. This is an experimental model uh, investigating the blood flow velocity in the recommend PCI after stenting. If we perform the pot, uh, the pot can potentially improve the coronary flow towards circumflex. But POT is not simple binary procedure. We have to consider uh, which position is favor for the POT. So if we perform the POT uh, just proximal to the carina, the blood flow pattern uh, is quite similar to the uh, result stent. So POT at just proximal to the carina can make coronary flow pattern to a circumflex more physiological. So even a pot alone can improve coronary flow to a circumflex. So re next, let's think about load of each technique in left main PCI. We established another experimental model, including all the steps in the left main bifurcation PCI, and just stand a pot alone, KBT alone, and a pot KBT, and pot KBT report. Then we gave the coronary flow from the left main and measured flow volume in each vessel. This is the result. Now, interestingly, even only port flow volume pattern towards the circumflex was mostly improved, even better than the KBT. But 
Once if we perform the KVT, report significantly improved the flow volume towards circumflex when compared with no report. So now we get a lot of insight from the um, in vitro studies, but now uh, it's time to think about the clinical relevance, whether these findings could be relevant to clinical outcome reasonably or not. After the introduction of the, our concept, uh, several studies were reported this year on the, this topic. This is the data from the AOI registry conducted in Japan. They evaluated uh, 738 patients who underwent restroom PCI with a single crossover technique and then compared uh, uh, the long-term clinical follow-up uh, between uh, with KBT and without KBT, and then they found that at five-year follow-up, final KBT after single crossover stenting in left main bifurcation did not affect adverse cardiac event. This is another uh, data from the Korean group. Uh, after the single crossover stenting, they put a pressure wire in the circumflex, and then they compared they evaluated the long-term follow-up based on the, this uh, physiological, physiological assessment. And then they found if FFR in the second flex is negative after single crossover stenting, even at a long-term follow-up, single crossover stenting in left wing bifurcation could be feasible and safe strategy. Now we are here. Uh, based on the accumulated data from our registry, Pico registry, now it's time to report our data on this topic. Uh, between 2005 to 2015, we had around 1,800 patients who, who underwent PCI for the, the novel left main with a DES. Um, after the exclusion of these uh, patients according to the uh, exclusion criteria, finally we got 616 patients who underwent single crossover technique with POT followed by, by KBT and no KBT. These are patient numbers uh, which we got in each uh, group. This is a baseline characteristic. Basically, all the values are well balanced between the two groups, except for the higher prevalence of the CKD in the non KBT group and for the PCI in the KBT group. And also, region characteristics are well balanced between the two groups regarding the procedure. Uh, intravascular imaging rate is quite high in both groups, and uh, POT was similarly done in the both groups. And the second DS was more implanted in the non-KBT group. Now we have uh, around five years follow-up. We're going to uh, target region failure. There is no significant difference between the two groups, and TL rate as well. In both groups, cardiac death and the MI rate was quite low, so target region failure was mainly driven by TLR. However, there is no statistical difference in the TLR rate between with and without KBT. Based on our interest, we additionally analyzed the TLR rate uh, divided into the main branch and side branch. TLR rate at the circumflex system was higher in the non-KBT group compared with that in the KBT group. This was not a result we expected. However, let's think about the details. What's going on after recommend PCI? For sure, after uh, single crossover stenting, we leave some malaposed rat around the circumflex system, and then at the follow-up, we will have the a certain amount of new intimal proliferation over the malaposed strand strut, then, uh, which can be one of the mechanisms of the circumflex ostium and lysinosis, as we discussed yesterday. And also, we additionally uh, evaluated the area uh, at the both post PCI and the follow up and they compared them, calculating the area change. Uh, this is a result. At nine months follow-up after serotonin serotonin stent implantation for the rectum, main, the area narrowing was around 30%. Uh, on the other hand, interestingly, if we look at a uh, Iberorim serotonin stent, the area narrowing was much lower, uh, which was uh, significantly lower uh, when compared with that after the serotonin implantation. So 
we can expect that uh, this phenomenon could be overcome by the improvement of the same technology such as the thinner slot on the more com biocompatible polymer or the better scent design. So let's go back to the, our clinical data. According to these findings, we additionally evaluated the TLR rate uh, dividing into the first generation and the second generation. Then after recommend PCR with first generation DS, TLR rate as circumflex system was significantly higher in the non-KBT group compared with that in the KBT group. Uh, however, second generation DS, uh, there is no significant difference in the TLR rate at the second flex system between the two groups. So with the second generation DS, recommend single crossover stenting followed uh, part with the KBT could be one of the feasible and fa safe strategy considered. Uh, in order to uh, evaluate this result more precisely, we conducted the propensity soil matching in the second generation DS group. Then we got 107 uh, paired patients in each group. This is the result. Even after PS ma uh, propensity matching in the second generation DS group, TLR rate as a second flex system without KBT was comparable to that uh, the KBT. This is a current our, uh, conclusion in this field. So, <clears throat> But so let me uh, emphasize that we don't want to say this is this can be the default strategy for the rest of main PCI. For sure, in some cases we need a kissing barrier inflation, even the uh, uh, provisional stenting for side branch. So this is just uh, one of the potential uh, strategy for the rest of main PCI. Make it simple. Now we are going uh, the next step the comparison of the flow pattern in the circumflex among the different verification angles, port, KBT, and report. Our hypothesis is that regarding the coronary flow pattern in the circumflex, for the cases with wider verification angle, port alone would be comparable even better uh, than the KBT with uh, Im improved world share stories. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you. This was a this very great. It was a great presentation, particularly highlighting the pot and repot as well. Uh, w one thing we have to mention is why pot is so important is that a lot of times we have a mismatch of the reference vessel that is so mm -hmm. tremendous that if you don't pay a very good attention to it, that will have other problems as well in bifurcation. That's probably when you measure a TLR outcome or something like that. That's why pot versus no pot always becomes. Um, a very important thing. Uh, I want to also highlight that in the Excel uh, uh, sub-study around the same subject, yep. uh, we find a very similar presented the earlier this year, and uh, you will read in the 2020 in Euro intervention, uh, the, the full paper, uh, that uh, again, not much difference with a, a kissing balloon, um, as exactly you said, with the second generation DS and all that. I think there is a question from there, Dr. Borzota. Good morning. Don't, don't you think that uh, after all this uh, subgrouping uh, to first, second, you lose uh, the uh, potential, the um, power, statistical power to show differences? Because uh, I still see that there are some divergence in, into the curves, and uh, P is uh, not, uh, I mean, uh, 0 0.9, it is uh, 0 0.130. Mm -hmm. So, w which is uh, your, your, your perception regarding the power? Because if you do not find uh, uh, differences, uh, there is the argument of power of your analysis. Thank you so much, nice question. So, actually, this is a retrospective study, so we need more data with a big number. But so, in order to see the tendency of this type of the topic, uh, even with a small number, we can see some tendency, and it's very important um, conduct uh, something like a prospective study, uh, which will go on the, uh, in the future. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Mitomo, congratulations, yep. nice, nice presentation. I'll go to computational flow dynamic part of the presentation. You show improvement in flow both with pot isolated, but also with KBT. Uh, 
since kissing balloon is the only technique that can put Karaina in the focus in the center, we were expecting better improvement in flow pattern with KBT compared to pot alone. Uh, thank you so much. So this is a very simple uh, Bessel model. So in the clinical setting, we have to consider some, for example, the position of the link around the carina, so-called uh, link connected link flow. At that time, even the, the same kissing by inflation, the the flow pattern could be the very differ each other. So this is <laughs> just because of the very simple. So, but so based on this study, what? I want to highlight is basically put with thought that just the te uh, technique for prevent uh, for the beta kissing bar inflation, but it's not the step for the kissing bar inflation. Sometimes just both can improve the coronary flow towards circumflex. That is. A yeah, uh, as this, is, this is a cooperation between Italy and uh, Japan. I wanted to ask you, maybe I missed out on that, but uh, was there a difference in the use of intercoronary imaging? And was there, uh, like if you just take the Japanese patients and the uh, Italian patients, did you see differences? Uh, thank you so much. If we compare the patient who are treated in uh, uh, Japan and uh, Italy, there are some difference regarding the penetration rate of the intravascular imaging, but totally, if we see the total rate of the intravascular imaging, uh, it's over 80. Yeah, well, a lot of work with pot and the kissing balloon, uh, one wonders that the left main bifurcation particularly, there will be much less of that if, we, if uh, uh, dedicated bifurcation stents come to market at some point. That's uh, the whole purpose behind this forum, and I, and I wonder that there's just a lot of work doing someone's left main in and out with many different kissing and recrossing and this and that. Uh, uh, thank you very much. It's a great so presentation. Much. We move on. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, next presenter will be Nicolas Amabile. Nicolas, please uh, come, because Dr. Kassab could not make it to come, and we are using opportunity to present also nice work of Nicolas. Thank you, Goran, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I thank. I would like first to thank the org EBC organization committee first for the initial invitation, and then for rescheduling, because now I'm really glad uh, I was able to do it through the strikes in Paris and Barcelona. So um, <laughs> my talk will be about stent under expansion and stretch malaposition. Uh, as you all know, these uh, under expansion and stretch malapositions are frequent findings. Uh, within a bifurcation lesion PCI. Uh, for example, this, uh, this um, series by Francesco Borzotta and colleagues uh, exploring 55 patients with bifurcation and OCT analysis and applying the music criteria. And as you see, uh, the authors reported that a stent under expansion was observed in almost one half of the patient and, and stent malaposition in almost all patients. So this is a very frequent finding in a uh, stable condition, but it's also quite frequent um, into stent thrombosis for bifurcation. And for example, in the PESTO, tri uh, PESTO registry, and we presented this data two years ago, uh, we observed that um, malaposition was present in one third of the patient with uh, bifurcation lesion stent thrombosis and under expansion in 20%. And most of these mechanical abnormalities were mostly present in the main vessel uh, part of the bifurcation. So as you know, stent expansion is quite challenging to assess because uh, with the rise of intracoronary imaging, we have been proposed many, many different expansion criteria, either for IVUS or OCT with bare metal stent or drug editing stents. And sometimes uh, all these criteria, criteria are not completely in line. And this busy slide summarizes some of, of, of these criteria. And fortunately, two years ago, um, the EAPCI PCI, uh, published this consensus uh, imaging document that define um, stent under expansion as a stent with a minimal stent area below 5.5 square millimeters with IVUS or 4.5 with OCT, or alternative um, uh, definition was a minimal stent area divided by the average reference lumen below 80%. But there is one problem. All these criteria have been developed for straight vessel and not for bifurcated lesion. 
and the assessment of a correct uh, stent expansion within bifurcation remains challenging and uh, cannot be really um, uh, approached by this criteria because this criteria did not, do not integrate the diameter discrepancies between main vessel and main branch. Um, and these conventional methods are based on cross-sectional geometric analysis. Uh, let me show you how uh, it could apply. These are the doctor's expansion criteria that have been proposed by the consensus document. And you see that in this uh, approach, the stent is not divided and we will measure the minimal stent area and, the, and both proximal and distal uh, reference segment liminal area and the expansion will be calculated as the ratio between minimal stent area and the average reference liminal area over 80%, that is a success. If we have the element free, if we go for the element free criteria, that's a little different because because then the stent is divided in two halves, equal halves, distal and proximal, irrespective of the position of the carina, and that's very important. And then we redo the same ratio between minimal stent area and reference luminal area, and both expansion uh, in the distal and proximal parts have to be over 90% to define a success. But let's try to apply these criteria in real life. That's an example of a patient with a left main that was treated by a conventional uh, pot uh, kissing repot approach with a 3.0 stent expanded up to 4. That is a final angel view that looked nice to us. We analyzed this patient with RCT. This is a 3D reconstruction of the stent and uh, we were also quite pleased with the result because we felt that the stand was quite expanded, uh, quite well expanded and well opposed and that the stand area was uh, in line with the natural tapering of the left main. But if we do the math now, that's another story because you will see that distal reference area will in the LED will be measured up at 5.6 square millimeter. The prox reference area was 10.8. If we apply the element free analysis, you see that the blue line here uh, is the division of the stent. The carina is the green line. And you see that the expansion in the distal part of the stent is 83%, and in the proximal part of the stent is 56%. So it's quite disappointing, and that can be explained because the minimal stent area of the proximal part of the stent is measured not on the left main, but on the LAD. And that's even worse if you go for the doctors that do not divide, the doctor's criteria do not divide, the doctor's um, approach does not divide the stand, and then the minimal stand area is still there on the LAD 4.7, and the ratio will be 57%, so it will be a major failure. However, you understood now that, the, um, that these approach are currently limited because they do not take into account the discrepancies be between prox and reference, uh, prox and distal reference uh, area. And also it doesn't take into account the natural tapering of the vessel, especially in the left main. Um, and we still have uh, issues to define the reference area into the polygon of confluence zone and we, we are completely lost there. So there are uh, alternatives. The first one that we propose for our le uh, lemon study will be uh, to divide the stents in two segments and uh, the division will be performed at the carina and so you define two segments, a prox upstream carina segment and a distal downstream carina segment and you redo the same ratio between the minimal stent area and the reference segment uh, luminal area and both segments have to be expanded up to over 80% to define success. Another approach has been proposed by Nakamura and colleagues and published two, year, two years ago. They proposed to divide the stents in three different sections, including a prox section, a distal section, and a uh, carina uh, section. They will measure the, uh, they will perform a cross-sectional uh, analysis uh, and uh, they will calculate for each segment the ideal lumen area based on the prox reference uh, segment area for the prox segment distal and here uh, for the polygon of confluence they will define the ideal lumen area as the mean between the distal and the prox area an expansion index will be calculated for each frame it's the measured stent area 
divided by the ideal lumen area. And so that are the res results they reported. And even with this uh, approach, they f uh, were quite disappointing by the expansion they measured uh, because, once again, it doesn't take into account the natural tapering of the vessel. But they observed that the minimal stent area is more frequently located in the diesel segment of the stented bifurcation, which makes sense, whereas the minimal expansion index is more frequently identified within the proximal segment. As for the strength of position, I will be uh, shorter. Once again, we can stick with the proposed um, consensus uh, document criteria. A significant matter position is defined by a, um, a strut with a distance over 0.4 millimeter to the vessel wall and one millimeter in length for the for the stand. Uh, an example from, uh, but once again, there are some issues. That's another example from our cath lab. Uh, the patient was treated with um, uh, a conventional uh, uh, on the left main with uh, this pot kissing uh, approach. We performed some OCT run before, after the pot, and after the final kissing uh, inflation. And you will see that actually, the in, in real life, the final kissing inflation has a really a real impact on their position. And uh, in the polygon of confluence zone, you will see here that before the uh, before the final kissing, there was a huge malaposition at the ostium of the side branch. Whereas when you after the final kissing, the position decre the malaposition decreased, but it's still not completely opposed to the vessel wall. Should we correct that? We don't know, because none of the all the stretch malaposition should be corrected. The EBC consensus document from last year proposed to correct the the, stand, the stretch with malapositions distance over 250 micrometer, whereas the European EAPCI consensus document proposed to uh, correct the, um, the malapose stretch with a distance over 40, 400 micrometer and malaposition length over one millimeter, at least in the main vessel, in the main branch. For the ostium side branch, it's still debated. And just rem just keep in mind that the side branch ostium could not be accurately explored by uh, imaging run going from the main vessel to the main branch, the main branch from to the main vessel, sorry, because it will then overestimate the distance um, in the in the awesome side branch, so the um, solution could should be maybe to do for all the all the all these uh, uh, procedures to perform a side branch um, or CT or IVS run to towards the main vessel. So to conclude, the best cr imaging criteria for bifurcation PCI quality assessment are not completely established, and all for consensus criteria exist for non bifurcated lesion they might not be applicable, applicable as they are to the bifurcation. The malaposition criteria can be applied to main, main, uh, main vessel and main branch, for sure, for ostium side branch, that should be debated. And we have to um, provide special attention in the future to redefine our objective for adequate stent expansion into this bifurcation. Thank you for your attention. Hi, Nicolas. Great Thank presentation. You. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, we presented in the last TCT our experience applying prospectively uh, a set of optimization targets for IBUS guided uh, main stenting. And uh, as you presented here, we are using percentage of expansion, not absolute lumen, because some people was dealing with the absolute thresholds, you know, the cutoff value, you know, to get at least 10, like get at least 8, which is really a uh, statistical thing. You know, it's not real. Individual level is not sense. You know? And uh, we have seen that we improve the prognosis of patients compared to just our core patients with IBUS guidance but without optimization targets. That's operator level decision. And uh, the problem was for the diffuse disease in lead main because we don't ha see any reference. In many cases, the whole length of the lead main is disease, is sick. And in this case, we decided to use the uh, smallest external elastic membrane area, the smallest, because sometimes you see tapering and to get 90% of this area as the hypothetical uh, target. It was useful because uh, at least the operator, particularly when young operators, they, they can really have something to, 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 to get as a reference because it's very difficult. No? Maybe some people is finally treating this uh, lead main lesions with a three, four, three, five millimeters of stent in a stent that is really, in a lead main that is really huge. Uh, but they don't know if it's definitely uh, safe because we don't have many cases. What is your approach for these cases? really diffuse the uh, lead main when there is no reference at all? We, we 
sure that's that's a common situation that's a very difficult one and we don't have any consensus or even guidance for that so in our hands and in our care lab we're doing a little li uh, like you maybe not using the 90 percent uh, uh, but maybe 80 going up to 80 percent uh, not to be too aggressive but i think that that will that that's a very good approach and it can be also we could face the same issues for example in a lad diagonal bifurcation sometimes the di lad is uh, massively diseased and and identifying the the correct landing zones and the correct uh, refer the correct reference uh, area is, is is really challenging okay if no further questions thank you very much thank nicolas so next presenter is Dr. Sheng Xian Tu, intracoronary osteo derived FFR for assessment of stenosis severity. Thank you, Chairman. Dear Chairman, dear colleague, uh, it's my privilege to be invited to be here. Uh, so, my name is Sheng Xian Tu. I work in Shanghai. Uh, this is my disclosure. Uh, we know that uh, the under maximum uh, hyperlimic FFR can be approximate by the uh, pressure ratios, as also demonstrated in the recent uh, uh, in vivo study uh, published in Czech. Uh, so essentially, actually, uh, FFR is measuring the pressure gradient or pressure drop uh, uh, under maximum hyperlimic. And we know that the pressure drop is determined by both uh, stenosis geometry and downstream perfuse flow. So if you have more uh, downstream flow, uh, then you have a higher pressure drop, and if you have more severe lesion and more eccentric lesion, eventually you will have more pressure drop as well. So if you want to calculate FR, you need to know both, uh, reconstruct them both accurately. Uh, and what about the vessel elasticity? So this is a flow uh, structure interaction analysis we perform. As you can see, uh, the flow is a pulsatile uh, in nature that would have uh, also uh, impact the uh, vessel wall deformation and vice versa, uh, the deformed uh, vessel wall will uh, influence the flow and the pressure gradient. So if we uh, change the plaque component, because in computer simulation, so if we change the plaque component from different, from for example, lipid to calcium, as you can see the impact of the uh, FFR is, uh, uh, is not that big, it's 0.03. So uh, this might uh, explain why uh, using a uh, rigid wall or uh, without knowing the plaque component can be calculated FFR. And create, we create also a lot of model. And interestingly, what we found out that actually the impact of plaque component is the maximum for intermediate lesion, not for mild lesion or for severe lesion. As you can see, uh, the C and, uh, and the lower panel, uh, the uh, mild lesion or uh, severe lesion, there's almost no impact. But intermediate lesion, there's some impact by the plaque component on the FR. Uh, but the difference is not that big. So uh, clinically, it might be susceptible to assume that uh, without knowing the black component, you do the uh, computation. And second, uh, in this uh, experiment study, as you can see, using the pulse type flow and steady flow, you will get almost the same FFR uh, because FFR is also evolved over the cardiac cycle. Uh, that make the computation easier because then you can assume steady flow instead of using pulse type flow. They can speed up the computational process. So these two, uh, uh, fundamentally, uh, to support the fast computation of FFR in vivo. So I proposed actually a, a, a method called QFR a few years ago to calculate the angiographic image from, uh, uh, so calculate FFR from the angiography image called QFR that's available now uh, by the angio plus system uh, by post or QAngio access 3D by Medias. And a number of study, the 17 uh, study published in different center that it has been approved, uh, improved that uh, it can get a uh, high diagnosis accuracy uh, once you have good angiography projection. But for those uh, patients without a good angiography projection, for example, uh, significant for shortening and overlap, and especially for post-PCI setting, when you put a stand there, and in an angiography, you don't see the stand, so you don't see the male position and expansion, so angiography image-based FFR has a limitation. So in this case, we think that the intracoronary imaging based FFR might be a good solution. That first solution we propose is the OFR, OCT based FFR. So to bring two procedures, two separate instrumentation into one procedure, one instrumentation. Thus, this is the software we developed. It allows you to also uh, do 3D reconstruction of the OCT and also quantify uh, under expansion uh, and also mirror position automatically. 
So the analysis step is that first you need to do the uh, automatic lumen contour segmentation and 3D reconstruction. And after that, uh, you will get this cut plan perpendicular to the side plane center line and quantify the area. This is very important to estimate the natural depth of the vessel uh, reference diameter uh, along the vessel as, as, as uh, illustrated by the previous speaker. That is very important to have the natural uh, depth. And second, uh, then we can use the QFI algorithm to compute the OFR. I'm going to show you a video uh, that uh, record in real time to show how fast this analysis can be done and quite automatically. So first you click and then the lumen contour are automatically linear and you can check whether the result uh, is okay or not. If you have subtle, you can click. Then you can detect the stand strap automatically as well and you can also detect the cyber and oxtail. And then you can get the result, the OFR result automatically co-registered with the uh, OCT and also stand reconstructed. So the entire analysis can take less than uh, one minute. Uh, it can be quite completely automatic. But if you have, a, for example, some uh, artifact, you might need correction. So on evolution, including the menu correction time, uh, the evolution analysis time is one minute. That is a significant shorter than the QFR and FFR as deployed in the Fever 2 uh, Europe study. So this is two examples to show you uh, the, uh, the comparison. So these two anatomically looks very similar. Uh, or uh, both are uh, left man uh, LAD, proximal LAD lesion. And the left one actually have a uh, higher minimal lumen error compared to the right one. But the FR in the left one is lower than the right one. And the compute OFR correlates very well with the uh, measure FFR. So we have done actually three validation study, two retrospective study, and one prospective study. The first uh, retrospective study was published in Euro Intervention. So in uh, data from come from Swiss three country, in 125 vessels, we saw that the diagnostic accuracy of OFR is 90%, significantly higher than the minimum lumen alloy. And if the OFR analysis was analyzed by the same user one month later, or by the second user, you get almost the same result with a very small standard deviation, 0.02 and 0.03. This is a second study that is uh, currently under review. So in Japan, from Wakayama a Medical University, uh, we include all the patients in a certain period with uh, both OCT and FR, so no selected all the patients were included. So in 212 vessels, and we were able to compare OFR, QFR, and the minimal lumen error and OCT. As you can see that OFR is better than QFR, and much better than minimal lumen error and 3 qz And interestingly, you see the diagnosis accuracy of QFR 87% is exactly the same what we report in the first favorite pilot study that we present in 2016, that uh, actually uh, can confirm the robustness of the analysis. And a small uh, prospective study that has been finished that is also currently under review. In 59 patients, we saw that the diagnostic accuracy of 93% was a narrow uh, limit agreement with standard deviation of 0.05. So in this study, we also uh, saw that the, uh, the inter-observability uh, is almost the same as uh, in the respective study with standard deviation of 0.03, so narrow limit agreement. And also another important finding of this study is that we actually, in uh, patient, we, we do two pullback with different pullback speed. So one is 18 millimeter per, per, uh, per second, the other one is 36. And uh, if you do the second pullback, the cardiac uh, phase will be different as well. So this all together contributes to this, uh, slightly uh, higher standard deviation, 0.04, it's still uh, very good. So we think that this application can be targeted at, at this moment for the post-PCI optimization. As you can see, uh, this study published in 2000, uh, 18 pull out the data from FEM1 and FEM2 study. Actually, uh, in quite high percentage of patients, the post PCI FR is suboptimal. So, one third of them is below 0.88. So, this patient has a worse clinical out outcome. So, how to improve it? We think that maybe the OFR can be a good tool to, uh, in this scenario. For example, in this case, uh, so when you do the OFR calculation, then you have them co register. So, the operator decide to put a stand from here to here, uh, and then uh, the, first, the delta OFR, the OFR drop at the standard segment is 0 0.0117. So, uh, and you have a residual OFR as shown in uh, here. So residual OFR is 0 0.89. That means that if you put a stand from here to here, then your uh, base OFR will in improve from 0 0.72 to 0 0.89. So this is similar like uh, virtual standing. But one of the limitations for virtual standing or, or residual OFR is that you can only assume that this segment is completely revascularized, meaning that there's no pressure drop uh, there. But actually, this is sometimes not the case. For example, as you can see from here in this case, there are still some stand male position and expansion. 
that contribute to a pressure drop uh, at the standard segment of 0.06. So then your vessel OFR is not 0.89, it's 0.82 because there are some residual stand nodes, uh, some, some stand edge uh, as well. So uh, in this case, uh, you know immediately that there's, you might need to do some optimization. So in this case, uh, the uh, larger bloom size was used and to optimize it. And then the, the delta OFR at the standard segment was reduced from 0.06 to 0.02. That uh, contribute to improvement of the uh, vessel OFR from uh, 0.82 to 86. And as you can see also from here, you can measure uh, tapping of the reference vessel. So I think the, a lot of argument on the uh, uh, under expansion, how to calculate it, this would be a good tool to calculate under expansion because you have a natural tapping of the vessel uh, as your reference. So using, using OFR, uh, you can assess the uh, both anatomical and the functional uh, du uh, in the online during the procedure and give you more complete uh, information for your stand optimization. And I would like to also use the opportunity to invite you to, we are organizing the international uh, course on computer physiology every two months in Shanghai. So uh, to have a more uh, in-depth discussion about the technology and also to have hand-on experience uh, with the uh, software. And ladies and gentlemen, I would like to leave the last slide with the conclusion point, and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, nice and innovative. Any questions for Dr. Tu? Yes, I, okay. Yeah. Well, my question is very quick. So um, uh, it's a very interesting, really, the first time I see something that you do angioplasty, and with one device you have morphology and physiology. This is the things that I think all, every one of us wants to, to have. My question is about the gray zone uh, of uh, uh, OCT. It, um, because probably, probably you have a, a, a gray zone quite uh, dangerous, according to me. I mean, uh, something like 75, 80 means that you can have stenosis up to 40 to 70 percent. Generally, these methods, because they are not really physiologic, have a very bad green zone. Uh, that's very, uh, I think, very good comment. Actually, uh, if you're talking about FR itself, it also has a gray zone. So it has been demonstrated in study that if you have an FR, uh, about 0.77 to 0.83. If you do a measurement of FR again, so 20% will change direction. So actually, you don't have good reference uh, to validate any computational physiology. So any computational physiology, when it's close to the cutoff value, you will have a low accuracy. And I think one uh, good thing about OFI is that you have both imaging and physiology at the same time. I think within this gray zone, maybe you need to make your decision combining both. So also the black vulnerability is also important. Uh, so I think that maybe that would be the good way to go. Location club, and yes. when I see your all models, I cannot see any side branch in your simulated model. So my question is that the is the presence of side branch integrated in your main branch model, or the presence of side branch does not influence on your uh, assumption? And second, a uh, question is that the Assuming that the presence of side branch is integrated anatomically in the main branch, if there is a single diagonal branch with a very tight stenosis which cannot be integrated in your model, would that be influenced in your OCT derived FFR, or the, you don't need to care about the uh, side branch at any time? That's a very good comment. Uh, I think side branch is very important. Uh, indeed, this is bifurcation curve. And actually, uh, the uh, difference between OFR and QFR is that it, it did include this bifurcation model. As you can see, this uh, tapping of the reference diameter because the size of the reference. So we actually calculate the uh, size of the, uh, the, 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 the area of the cybrans of steel uh, by this cut plan. And then we uh, use them to calculate because you don't have flow by, not like angio, you can get a flow. But for the OCT, you have to calculate the uh, uh, calculate the flow, uh, and the flow can be calculated using. So, in our unique point is that we have a way to uh, uh, calculate the uh, uh, theoretically uh, maximum hyperlimic flow downstream uh, using this reference uh, contour because the reference, uh, I mean, the myocardium mass has a linear correlation with the. A reference coronary size, as demonstrated in previous study, 
So uh, we are not calculate, we are not segment the myocardial mass, but we actually reconstruct the, the uh, reference coronary segment and then use them to calculate myocardial mass. And that explains why the OFR, although does not take into account this timid firm count, have also good correlation. But still, your model does not uh, 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 does not count on the presence of disease at the side branch. You just you count the osteum, yes. so that the yes. That's presence the or not, yes. so it can be encountered in, 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 in your model, right? Definitely, yes. So, yeah, um, maybe this fits in here. Uh, I am in need of learning from you, because uh, if I have an LAD with a with, uh, with myocardium that's fully intact, and if, if I have an LED where there's only scar, how, does, uh, th how is this influence in your model? That do you find it in your o OCD derived uh, flow? Do you see anything uh, that hints you that this is scar? So, a very good point. I think theoretically, uh, actually, uh, one of the now uh, disadvantages of our OFR, computer FR, is like if you have a scar. Uh, theoretically, uh, you will not uh, you will influence the FR value, but the OFR value cannot be uh, changed because you don't know the scar behind this. And actually, we look into the data. The all the, we pull out all the data, three data, four hundred patients, and actually we did not find there's a correlation between the uh, previous myocardial infarction with respect to the difference between OFR and FR. And that might be explained that. So first of all, uh, the impact might be that big because you don't have a substantially uh, myocardial infarction. And another thing I think uh, vice versa, the advantage of OFR compared to FR is that if you have a uh, microcirculation dysfunction. So in that case, the FR is not uh, accurate, might be by pressure wear. And OFR will be better. So I, I, I don't know which one is better, especially in the post-PCI setting. You have a, put a stand there, and you might cause some distal embolization there. So if you measure FFR there, are you going to get a suboptimal or not accurate result? But our well, OFR is not influenced. Okay, thank you very much, Shengxi, and excellent. <laughs> Next speaker is Manuel Pan, feasibility and efficacy of jailed pressure wire. Thanks, Gordon. I'm going to, to present a, <clears throat> a paper uh, based in an old idea from Alfonso Medina. As you can see in the, in the slide on the left, uh, we present an abstract uh, from the ESC in 2001, where um, it's a preliminary experience with the, with the pressure wire that was jailed and we use adenosine in order to evaluate the result of the side branch. The, this study was not published and, and remained uh, in the time, but uh, we, we took the, the, the idea 18 years later and we used the, 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 the same technique using the IFR instead of, of the FFR. So we simplify the, the, the idea of, of Alfonso and perform the, the study that uh, I'm going to, to present. As, uh, as you know, the evaluation of the side branch during provisional stenting is difficult. It's a, maybe a challenge because uh, a dissection produced by a balloon may be difficult to evaluate by angio. It's difficult to, decide, uh, to decide when stenting or not, or what to continue with the procedure. Some, uh, some proposal of uh, in terms of uh, timid flow or um, or FFR has been have been have been done, but we pretend to 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 use the the IFR as a new index to evaluate the the status of the side branch during provisional stenting. Also. Um, an objective or our study is to evaluate the, the safety and feasibility of maintaining the pressure wire jailed during the procedure in order to obtain all the information along all the steps uh, during provisional stenting. In the methods is summarized here. The pressure wire was passed to the Cybran before treatment. Main vessel stenting and Cybran was predilected according to the operator criteria. 
IFR, determination was obtained in the Sebran at baseline condition and um, after main vessel stenting, leaving the, the pressure wire jailed. And afterward, the, the wire was removed to main vessel ostium to, in, to discard the possibility of drift. Of drift. Cybrans post dilation was considered if Cybrans IFR was less than 0.89, as in non coronary, uh, uh, um, as in non bifurcation coronary lesion. We uh, have a preliminary study of 50 patients. The clinical data is summarized in this slide. There was a relatively young patient, 64. Uh, um, prevalence of uh, male risk factor are also summarized and similar to our normal population of coronary patient. The procedural data is on the right. Um, we use a radial approach in most of the cases, multivessel in 50%. The most frequent uh, treated bifurcation lesion was the LED diagonal bifurcation. The Medina classification uh, is summarized also here. Uh, the presence of 111 was uh, around one third, uh, 50, almost 50 percent was uh, a pseudo, pseudo bifurcation lesions. So, so we include all, uh, all type of uh, Medina classification and all the patients were treated with drug eluting stent. The result in terms of IFR is summarized on the right. You can see that at baseline you have a, a low IFR that, that may be conditioned by the, the proximal main vessel disease also. After main vessel stenting, the, the IFR increased to 0.9. After cyber treatment, all the, the cases were normalized and we, we have the problem of the drift in 10% of the, of the, of the cases. This slide summarizes the patient flow chart. It seems to be a little bit complicated, but uh, maybe simple. It's complicated because of, of the drift. In the first uh, line, you can see the, 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 the result obtained in terms of IFR and in terms of uh, angiographic evaluation. The angiographic evaluation was by visual estimation. We consider significant uh, cyber uh, lesion, uh, 60%, 80% by visual estimation and IFR was uh, uh, obtained in, in all the side branch at the beginning of, of the procedure. Mm, after after in, in five cases, uh, we have uh, the problem of the drift. Uh, drift means uh, descalibration of the wire that uh, obliged to the operator to repeat the procedure, but uh, after the correct information, uh, you can see that uh, all the patients with uh, no angiographic lesion ha uh, have a normal IFR. And patients mm, mm, that the operator consider to have a significant uh, angiographic lesion may have a abnormal IFR or an IFR um, bigger than 0.9 or not. So this is the this is the part of the flow chart. In case of a, a IFR um, bigger than a 89, mm, oh, the, the the procedure finish. And mm, if the uh, IFR was reduced, we mm, post dilate the side branch with a kissing balloon, and uh, all the case normalize or increase the IFR and finish the procedure. In, we don't need, we didn't need uh, the implantation of uh, an stent at the side branch. At the same time, we evaluate the damage of the, of the jelly wire. Uh, as you can see in the slide, mm, some degree of damage occurred, but uh, uh, this problem di uh, did not affect the, the performance of, of the sensor all the, the, the damage were distal to the pressure sensor. So the, the wire and the information still is valid. You can see the, we classify the, 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 the damage according with our previous study with a um, stereoscopic microscopy and, and some degree of the of damage occur, but the, 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 the information is still is, is, is okay. An example of a patient with a, a, a bifurcation lesion, um, it would be a Medina 100, 
after the main vessel stain plantation, you have a, a, some doubt at the level of the, of the side branch. Um, it's difficult to, to say if it's si if significant or, or not from an angiographic point of view, but according with the IFR, the, 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 the flow is, is normal. Another example in, in this case, you can see one, 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 one Medina classification probably after the main vessel stain implantation, a severe lesion occur at the side branch, but the physiological study reveal uh, a almost uh, normal flow. So in this case, we continue with, uh, with uh, without um, side branch balloon dilation. Another example similar with different uh, with different uh, IFR at the level of, of the side branch. Normal after after main vessel stenting, you can see uh, severe compromise that also is concordant in accordance with the physiological study. And after kissing, the the IFR is uh, is uh, is uh, normalized. The follow up is uh, is not uh, too long. It's uh, a little bit more than one year, 14 months of me, and only one one patient. Uh, presented in major cardiac adverse event uh, due to, to voluntary cessation of dual antiplatelet uh, treatment. So we can conclude that the use of gel pressure wire to, to, to monitor cyberant results from bifurcation treated by provisional attendance seems to be safe. The IFR index seems to provide new physiological information about the significance of the cyberant stenosis. And we, 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 we are going to, to hold a, a meeting in Cordoba in the next month to, to treat all these uh, physiological problems, and all of you are, uh, of course, invited. Thank you for your attention. Uh, this is a fascinating uh, uh, case. Uh, let me ask you a practical question. There was some uh, moderate damage in some of the wires. And you said that sometimes you had to take wire back and then have to, if there was a drift, yeah. you had to recross. Yeah. Um, uh, are these damaged wires were also able to recross or were, were you we changing failed. wires quite a no, bit when no. you go back second time? No, we failed to recross it only in, in one case. It was in the flow chart. You, you, can, you can also re recross and use the, the wire. But the, the problem of the drift uh, seems to be reduced by the new generation of wire. So th this study is useful if you don't need to, to, to check all the, the, the measurements. Of course, yes. thank you. So it's a, it's a but uh, the company changed. This, this uh, study was performed with the first generation of wires. So we hope to, to have better material in order to, to avoid all this. Uh, uh, Professor Serouis has a question. Yeah, it, it's a quite remarkable uh, presentation, and we have been discussing that for many times now at uh, ABC. Um, the, the drift, for instance, is always a drift in one direction, or if you can have uh, an overestimation or an uh, underestimation of both. I don't, I don't know, but if you, if you have a drift, you have to, to start the procedure again, calibrate the, the wire and, and, and recross in order to, to, to obtain, obtain the, the data. This I, I, don't, I don't know if, if the... This case of uh, 99 IFR, and it's a sub, sub, sub total between yeah. the, the circumflex yeah. and the obtuse marginal, if you give that uh, angiography to two, for instance, for uh, QFR, what kind of value is going to find? Did you do some uh, QFR versus IFR? Well, because well, I get well, lost to see something which yeah. is uh, without physical yeah. contact between yeah. the circumflex and the yeah. obtuse marginal and have uh, an IFR of uh, uh, 99. Yeah, yeah. it looks like... Uh, uh, yeah. The, for the moment, the 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 the, the follow-up shift of, probably of tight carina shift probably yeah yeah for the moment the, the follow-up of this patient is good uh, although you 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 can see a severe uh, stenosis by angio uh, the, 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 the because you can say Goran, you can say uh, shift shift of the carina fine that will explain the situation acutely 
But then you bring back uh, one of these experts in shear stress, and you say that shear stress he will stay for uh, one year. I'm not so sure. So uh, it, it's really puzzling to see one, an absence of contact between two mass of uh, contrast medium to a value which is so high that yeah. 99. Yeah. Uh, what do the three-dimensional echo with that, and what is the kind of shear stress at that place? I mean, I have a hard time to reconcile that. I don't contest the beauty of the data, but mentally I have a difficulty to reconcile all that. Yeah. Yeah, just also to come back, Dr. Ku said that, that the, the presentation by Dr. Tu did not, uh, really stayed in the main branch. So there was no simulation of going into the stent and then branching out to a non-stented side branch. That type of simulation, at least, I didn't see in that presentation. So maybe not exactly there, the OFR, but hopefully it will be. It will be very interesting. Uh, Robert Yan, and we have to proceed, otherwise we will be over time. So Manuel, uh, you, you include finally 50 patients. Uh, we have all been thinking about this approach, but we have all been so much warned to, to do the jailed wires, but of course you don't want to have the sensor uh, dislodged or something like that. So did you any exclude any patients due to proximal stent lengths to be expected. So if you have just eight or 12 millimeters proximal to the bifurcation or tortuosities where you put in the stents or calcified lesions proximal, so the longer calcified jailed wires. You, you have a concern about the, 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 the jailed wire. Uh, yes, yeah, you are right. No, this is a preliminary study and we, we select patient in order to, to, to have the information and to have the follow-up uh, to see what happened when you have a, a poor angiographic result and a normal physiological result. You are right. It, it, we, we never implant a second stent in order to, to, to produce the, the a jailet for, for two times. Um, and patients are, uh, as you can see in the, in the baseline data, relatively young. It's not, uh, it's, this is a pilot study in order to see what happened, and uh, we will see. No? Okay, thank you very much, Manolo. Great. Okay. Uh, we have to proceed. <laughs> Trend of bifurcation PCI from COBIS-1 to COBIS-3, Dr. Doch. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jun Young Do from Inje University from Korea. It's my great honor to present the trend of the bifurcation PCI in Korea from the COVID 1 to 3 registry. On behalf of the COVID 1 to 3 investigators, uh, I'll talk about this topic. In the COVID Coronary bifurcation stenting registry one two three was were the biggest coronary bifurcation multicenter registry in Korea, led by the investigator Hyun Chul Won in with COVID one and two. More than thirty papers published, and now the more than twenty papers seen in the pub medicine. The COVID three data latest uh, official bifurcation registry from of the Korean bifurcation club led by the president Dr. Bong Kang Gu is is became the latest uh, coronary bifurcation registry in Korea. Today I'll talk about the coronary bifurcation PCI trend in Korea using COVID-1, 2 and 3 registries comparing the inclusion criteria and baseline characteristic changes and to compare the treatment strategy changes and uh, how much change the clinical outcome from the COVID-1, 2, and 3 registries. The COVID-1 registry was the first uh, coronary bifurcation re registry in Korea between 2004 to 2006. And the six, 1,691 patient uh, with using the first generation drug eluding stent without the left main bifurcation treatment. COVID-2 treatment registry was the extended COVID-1 registry from the 2003 to 2009, uh, include, 
including the 2,897 patient with combined with the first and second generation drug eluding stent, the registry included the left main bifurcation treatment. The COVID-3 registry is the latest uh, bicoronary bifurcation uh, registry between the 2010 to 2014, including 2,648 patients and second generation drug eluding stent only treatment, including the left main bifurcation. The patient characteristic is quite similar between among the COVID-1, 2, 3, and as, as well as u, usual Korean patient population. The unstable angina and non stemi is the main di clinical diagnosis of the bifurcation disease. And then the stable ischemic coronary heart disease is, is the following popular clinical diagnosis in coronary bifurcation. The, interestingly, the recent COVID-3 data demonstrated the increasing, increased the rate of the, the left main bifurcation PCI trend more than 30% of the bifurcation treatment in Korea. So now I present uh, coronary bifurcation treatment strategies the more than 10 years from the COVID-1, 2, and 3 registries. The, the first uh, interesting finding is that transradial bifurcation intervention became uh, the, the default coronary bifurcation treatment strategy in Korea. In COVID-3 registry, the transradial intervention rate is more than the 50% in bifurcation treatment. In COVID-2 registries, the, the Transradial intervention rate temporarily decreased because of the include, include the left main bifurcation treatment rather than the COVID-1 registry. The COVID-1 registry data demonstrated the transradial bifurcation intervention uh, techniques provide a quite a similar procedural success and periprocedural myocard infarction and uh, periprocedural complication. The transradial intervention demonstrated less blood loss trend with the same bleeding complication compared to the transfemoral intervention. And the next interesting thing from our COVID-3 registries, the stent technique mostly frequently in Korea and the main technique was one stent strategy in non, both non-left main and left main bifurcation treatment. In non-left main bifurcation treatment, the one stent strategy is stable in more than 80% 80, 80 of the bifurcation patient. Interestingly, in left main bifurcation treatment, the two stent technique rate is decreasing with using second generation drug eluding stent, and the one stent technique is increasing uh, the rate, treatment rate in even in left main bifurcation treatment strategy. COVID-2 registry data demonstrated that uh, even in the left main bifurcation treatment, one stent technique provides a more beneficial favorable outcome rather than the two stent techniques that, as well as the non-left main bifurcation stent uh, <laughs> treatment provided. Uh, next uh, thing that we our trend from the COVID-1, 2, 3 registries, the, how, what is the difference but between the one stand, first generation drug eluding stand versus second drug generation drug eluding stand? In first generation drug eluding stand, the one stand techniques be provide a better clinical outcome than the two stand techniques. Then the, in if second generation drug eluding stand in Korea, the First, both one stent and two stent technique provide a quite similar, better clinical outcome with, in coronary bifurcation treatment. Another stent technique, uh, the trend of bifurcation PCI in Korea, the cross technique is the main and preferred two stenting techniques in Korea for, for, for the Korean doctors, except the COVID-1 registry. In patients who receive two 
the log loading standard in the bifurcation. The left main bifurcation and high syntax score and diabetes mellitus uh, were the poor outcome predictors. And the second generation drug eluding stent and using the non compliant balloon and final kissing balloon angioplasty was, were the, the better clinical outcome predictors. And the stent type and procedural optimization trend as the time is gone, the serolimus and paclitaxel eluding stent was gone. And now the Korean doctors use Everolimus eluding stent and the Jotarolimus eluding stent. The, the, the IBUS examination was used more than 40% of the bifurcation treatment. Now the final kissing balloon and final pot technique has become the user of the procedure optimization technique in Korea. And the pot technique concept developed in COVID-3 registries. Patients who received the one stent technique in bifurcation treatment, the final kissing balloon provided the better clinical outcome than the non-final kissing uh, balloon angioplasty. And even patients who did not receive the final kissing balloon angioplasty, part technique provided better clinical outcome than the uh, no non-part technique. And the, what was the changes the clinical outcome during the last uh, 10 years? The COVID-3 trial demonstrated a better clinical outcome than COVID-1 and 2 registries, and the, that may be explained the multiple factors, including the develop, development of the stent and technique and the other drugs. Ladies and gentlemen, I tried to I summarize the bifurcation PCI trend from COVID one to three. The left main bifurcation PCI in Korea is increasing. The one stent strategy is still preferred and main treatment technique of left in even with the left main bifurcation PCI. The cross technique is the most popular bifurcation PCI treatment in Korea. And the IBUS examination is popular and, and 40%, and translateral intervention became uh, the default assessment to, of the bifurcation PCI. The final kissing balloon reduced the, the major, card, major adverse cardiovascular event. The POT technique and concept developed in recent cl our clinical practice from the COVID-1 to 3 registries. The Clinical outcome gradually uh, improved with the multiple, including from the multiple clinical factors. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We always learn a lot from trends and from COVID registries. I have one question for Dr. Dong. Uh, in the group with two stands, you presented the predictors, independent predictors for outcomes but they didn't see the use of imaging. I didn't see IBUS among the predictors in this two vulnerable group. Now it's a most complex setting. You expect that imaging here is going to play a more prominent role. And in fact, in our registry in Spain of left main disease, uh, the, m the greatest difference in, uh, with uh, IBUS guidance versus no IBUS guidance was in the two stents, left main lesions. Left main lesions treated with two stents. Do you have any explanation or consideration about this, why imaging was not independent predictor among those treated with two stents? It's important, uh, the point, point of review. I, I agree, I totally agree that I was examination or other, another, uh, the imaging techniques may be critical in especially in left main bifurcation intervention. But uh, the, the for the several reasons in Korea, still the imaging devices in bifurcation PCI is not reimbursed. And the, the pure, not a pure clinical uh, purpose is the, still the, as a, 
I would see examination or the other imaging modalities are limited. As, uh, the, but I totally agree. You, the, in left main bifurcation intervention, the imaging, uh, comprehensive imaging uh, e evaluation is uh, help to improve the clinical outcome. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, we have next speaker, Dr. Nam, long-term outcome of one stand techniques in bifurcation PCI. Before my presentation, oh, please set up. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd like to answer your question about the COVID-3 I was. Proceed because we are very late. Oh, okay. So yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so it's my great honor to have a chance to share my experience with all of you. So I'd like to talk about the long-term outcome of uh, one stand bifurcation PCI, whether the, the side branch strut opening is uh, better or not. So we all know that in non-left main bifurcation, uh, in jailed side branch has uh, uh, some functional and anatomy discrepancy. And whether even though we often routinely according to several randomized study, Routine final kitchen inflation after simple crossover stenting did not make a better outcome. So that's why in the left main bifurcation, simple crossover stenting without a routine side branch offering is generally recommended. However, in left main bifurcation, as you can see in this situation, usually we recommend after simple crossover stenting uh, and uh, we do the routine uh, circumplex strut offering However, there is no clinical evidence about that. So previously, uh, 10 years ago, I have a chance to share uh, my experience that uh, there is also, non, non, uh, sem, uh, similar as a uh, non-left main bifurcation, also left main bifurcation also have uh, some discrepancy was existing within uh, uh, function and anatomy. But at that time, we didn't, I didn't show the, the long-term clinical outcome whether this kind of FFR-guided circumplex, jade circumplex treatment so last year, the EBC, during the EBC, I have a I have chance to show the long-term clinical outcome in that thing. And then fortunately, this year, I can publish that data in JAG intervention. So uh, if the jailed circumplex FFR is very high, the, even though we do not open the st uh, stance throughout, the clinical outcome was quite good. And if the FFR is very low, the clinical outcome is bad. But at that time, one uh, audience asked me that, why don't you often just, uh, just a strut offering? It's a very simple procedure. So uh, I agree it's a very simple procedure, but we have to use more uh, device and then uh, some possibility of uh, complication during the complex procedure. So previously, I have a chance to select 100, around 100 patients who don't have a uh, non-true left main bifurcation and then just a simple cross-up technique and without strut offering and follow up three years. At that time, the clinical outcome was quite good, but it, it, but it was a very small study, and then select only non-true uh, left main bifurcation. So this year, I'd like to answer the last year's audience question. So uh, the, the aim of this study was to evaluate the long-term clinical outcome according to side branch opening procedure of bifurcation region after one stent cross-up technique from COVID-3 V3. It will be better to show you this uh, study flow. So among the second generation DES, uh, 2,648 uh, patients, COVID-3, risk 3 and then we exclude uh, two cent strategy patients. So uh, finally, uh, 2,194 patient PCI with one stent strategy, including 682 patients with the left main bifurcation region. And a simple crossover without strut offering is uh, 1,685 patient, and then side branch opening patient is was around 509 patient. And we uh, decided clinical outcome as a five-year target reason failure, a composite of endpoint of uh, death from cardiac cause, and then target vessel MI and target reason devascularization. If you see the baseline characteristics, is well controlled, even though it's not a randomized study. But if you see the ejection pressure a little bit high in the side branch opening in numerically, and then uh, use of variable is a little bit low, but the number is not quite different. 
But if you see the angiographic base, baseline characteristics, it's definitely some difference. Side branch offering group has a higher instance of left main bifurcation. It's around 38% compared to simple crossover 29%. And then also left main bifurcation is similar. Uh, RAD bifurcation is similar, and then circumplex is a little bit high in simple crossover technique. In terms of a uh, true bifurcation reason, is nearly uh, fit at 60% in side branch offering group, and then simple crossover is 36%. Yeah. And the total number of standards is a little bit higher in uh, simple crossover standing group. About QCA data, as you can easily expect, the side branch group has a uh, uh, larger reference special diameter of a side branch, and then uh, also the more disease of a side branch. And then total uh, uh, reason length of a main basal is a little bit longer in simple crossover uh, group. And then uh, side branch length is a little bit longer in side branch opening group. But still, it's a five millimeter, uh, uh, meter is not so long reason. And after uh, main uh, simple crossover stenting, as you can see, the angiographic result uh, is better in side branch opening group because uh, you open the side branches. So minimal lumen diameter of side branch is a little bit larger in the side branch opening group. And then disease uh, is uh, quite good. The side uh, diameter stenosis is lower. And the maximum stand diameter is main vessel stand was a little bit larger because you do side branch opening. So that's why it's 3.4 compared to 3.3. And then final kissing inflation is side branch opening group has a uh, final kissing group is 77%. Uh, uh, and then uses of uh, uh, IBUS was around 40%. The part technique is balanced, it's around 30% between all group. And this is the primary end point. The target reason payload rate of a, a, a simple crossover group was of 7% compared to side branch opening group 6.7. And then even though there is uh, some angiography discrepancy, we do the adjust, and then p-value was quite same. And then if you see the secondary endpoint as a, a death from any cause was similar, and myocardial infarction, and revascularization, and also the incidence of Japanese stent thrombosis was not different between two groups. Uh, this is a cumulative five-year event rate as a couple of Maya curve as a target reason failure is not different to simple crossover and side branch opening, and cardiac death, target basal MI, and target reason revascularization also same. And then you are thinking about is, uh, it will be different between left main and non left main, but if you see the left side, the left main uh, subgroup showed uh, even though it's a statistically non different, but the numerically side branch opening group has a higher instance of a uh, target reason failure compared to just a simple crossover attack. And again, the non left main bifurcation is previously we already know that it's, it's will be the same. How about the true bifurcation? True bifurcation also same rate of a target reason failure uh, compared to simple crossover or side branch opening and non true bifurcation is the same. So I already mentioned that's not. Uh, this is a circular analysis, uh, whether the bidding group has a difference or not, but the left main bifurcation and true bifurcation is the same. And also, if you see whether uses of a IBUS or not, was not uh, uh, depends on the simple course of a technique or side branch opening, and also pot technique. It does not mean the, top, the pot is important or not, but the pot, whether pot do or not do, simple crossover and the side branch opening do not have a different outcome. So this study has some limitation because of the observation study, COVID-3 is the selection bias, so definitely have a, and we don't have an analysis about the additional imaging study, and the event rate is, as I already mentioned, that the uh, target reason failure rate is around 7% is very low, and, uh, even though we follow the five year, and then duration of that is also very important, but we don't have uh, that data detailed. So ladies and gentlemen, this is my uh, last summary slide. There is improvement of acute angiographic result in side branch opening after simple crossover stenting. However, side branch opening after simple crossover stenting did not show the improvement of a long-term clinical outcome compared to liver alone after simple crossover stenting. And then additional, in left main or true bifurcation reason don't have a different uh, result. Therefore, the routine Kissing inflation after simple crossover stenting may not be recommended, and the provisional approach with FFR guidance will help to select the patient who need the additional complex bifurcation procedure. 
Thank you. Uh, this is a great talk. Thank you very much. I have to uh, wa uh, caution, though, that the uh, subgroup results or left main uh, were re rather small uh, in numbers, and the, all the side branch lesions were rather short. The mean lesion length in the side branch was five millimeters. So I would yeah. say that this is mostly applicable to uh, very focal side branch uh, involvement in this right. uh, case. Yes, I totally agree. Exactly. Yeah. And let's move on to a keynote lecture regarding STEM behavior. Tim Mickley. What I'd like to do today is to discuss some basic concepts uh, behind um, stent design. Uh, I am a uh, employee of Boston Scientific. But let's get started. Overexpansion capability. Uh, this is a very important feature in a stent. Um, as you can see in this diagram, Right? You have large changes between distal vessel and proximal vessel. And you can see although a stent was chosen that can accommodate both the distal vessel and can accommodate the proximal vessel, once you place a balloon through this side cell and dilate, struts get pushed, pulled, and moved in very unique ways. And you can see now this particular row of struts has been completely maxed out. It cannot stretch any further, leaving behind a small resulting area of malapposition. So the, the main takeaway from this slide is when you're doing side branch interventions, you need larger overexpansion capability than the actual vessels you are treating. So how do we achieve overexpansion? Um, the two main factors in creating a stent for uh, uh, overexpansion are number of peaks and strut length. If you uh, direct your eyes towards me, I like to use this simple piece of wire to really drive home some of these points. But here you can see a simple design that has very long struts, which also means you have a very long lever arm, which means you've completely lost any radial strength but it does expand to large diameters. However, I can take this same piece of wire and I can make a design that has three peaks. Your lever arm is much shorter, you maintain radial strength, and it still expands to the same diameter. That is really the key to making large overexpansion uh, stents, is increasing the number of peaks while maintaining short uh, strut length in order to maintain radial strength. So now we're gonna talk about uh, side branch access. Uh, the measure we use in engineering is what we call CCD, or circular cell diameter. Um, this is simply the largest circle you can inscribe in a side cell is an indication of how easy it will be to cross through that geometry. Um, as you can imagine, we can come up with lots of different designs that would make a huge side cell access. But there are always trade-offs for everything in stent design. And in this case, the trade-off would be tissue prolapse. Right? So there's a very delicate balance between providing enough room to allow gear to be passed through the side cell while still maintaining uh, uh, the ability to scaffold tissue. Another factor is connectors, right? Connectors placed in a side cell, uh, it's not really hard to imagine, but it's going to make it more difficult to cross. You can see in this position here with a connector adjacent to it, that is going to be much more difficult to cross than this is, right? With a nice wide open patent side cell. Unfortunately, there's nothing we can do about that because the way a connector lands in a side branch is completely random. But things that we can do as engineers 
is we can look at the actual geometry of the stent itself. And here, if you look at these three images, here you can see, passing through the side cell, the tip of a post dilation catheter actually gets caught on this knob on the connecting link. In this case, it's actually engulfed an entire peak of the uh, stent, and again, will not cross. In this design, very simply, cradling of the wire, cradling of the tip of the balloon catheter will allow easier entrance into the side cell. So now we've talked about crossing the side cell, let's talk about expansion. So as you can imagine, again, connectors become a, a very important factor in uh, side branch expansion. Here, we have a stent that has three connectors positioned in the side branch. Here, we only have one connector in this entire side branch, but it's right in the middle of the side branch. Here, we have one connector, but it's more offset to the side. And if you look down here for results after kissing balloons, right, you can see the importance of connectors in the side branch. And again, there's not a whole lot that can be done about this other than through stent design. If we can reduce the number of connectors, we will probably have less probability of having connecting links positioned in the side branch. So to continue on with side cell expansion, um, another important factor is side cell expansion. We call it MECD, which is the maximum expanded cell diameter. This is a good indication of how large of a hole you can blast through the side of a stent. However, again, when it comes to bifurcation work, right, you can see here in this culotte, we have a balloon positioned, we're dilating through the side cell, but it's not this perfect circular shape. In fact, if you follow this green outline, which is the cell itself, it's a very complex and unusual shape, and it is a much larger diameter than what you would get from a typical circular measurement. So again, the important takeaway here is in bifurcation stenting, you usually need side cell access that's larger than the, the uh, branches you're actually treating. So thin struts, this is a, a very interesting conversation. And uh, thin struts are highly desirable because in all bifurcation techniques, you do have overlapping metal. It's just a result of bifurcation techniques. But as we try to thin out struts more and more, we must maintain radial strength. So luckily, radial strength is really simple beam bending mechanics. And again, if you would direct your eyes towards me, if you look at the image in the lower left of a stent that is expanding and then being crushed slightly by a lesion, and I can duplicate that here with this simple piece of wire. So I expand the stent with the balloon. Essentially, I'm straightening out these zigzag shapes and the vessels trying to crush it. And if you just think about this motion, I am bending the stent in the plane of strut width, right? I am not bending this stent in the plane of strut thickness. This is purely strut width. And why that's important is as we thin out struts, right, we do lose radial strength, but we make that radial strength right back by adding width to the struts. So a delicate balance of all of these uh, beam bending mechanics, um, you can actually achieve very thin strutted stents that still have high radial strength. So recoil. This is another subject that uh, I, I really enjoy speaking to because it's not often discussed and it's hugely important in, in bifurcation stenting and in stenting in general. And again, if I would ask you to direct your eyes towards me, anything made of metal when deformed, will recoil. It'll snap back. Anything made of metal will do that. The same thing happens with a stent. You expand it with the balloon. As soon as you deflate the balloon, the stent does recoil. And this is in air, right? You don't even have to be in a lesion 
just right here in open air, your stent will recoil. So why is that important in bifurcations? Because not only do you have recoil characteristics radially, you also have recoil in side cells. And in this simple picture here, you can see although these struts were displaced with the balloon, after balloon deflation, they recoiled back into the side cell. So what can we do as engineers to, to minimize this uh, effect? <clears throat> if you look at the three images here, these are three basic stent designs used today. Uh, here we have a continuous wire where all dimensions are equal. Here we have very wide struts, but narrow peaks. Here we have very wide peaks and more narrow struts. And if you focus on these areas that are kind of green and blue, light blue, these describe the areas of the stent that are actually deforming as you expand it. So in, sorry. So in this case, all of your bending occurs in the peak. In this one, all of your bending occurs in the peak. In this design, your bending occurs in two small focal areas adjacent to the peak. Again, if you provide your eyes here, this is bending throughout the entire peak. Lots of recoil. This is bending in two very focal areas, very minimal recoil. It's actually, as I said, a topic that isn't discussed often, but it is a very important part to stenting and specifically side branch stenting. So this is another question that I get uh, asked quite commonly from physicians, is if you thin out the struts of your stent, right, and you go to overexpansion, do you not lose radial strength? And the answer is when you post-dilate stents, and this is any stent out there, it's nothing special to Boston Scientific, any stent out there, as you increase its expansion, you also increase radial strength, all right? It's not intuitive. The reason for this is, again, if we look at this simple piece of wire, a straight column is much stronger than one with a bend in it. So if you think of a very simple stent design, here it is at nominal, here it is at four millimeters, here it is at four and a half, here it is at five millimeters, right? The more you expand this, the closer you get to that true column. So do not hesitate to post-dilate stents. Uh, stay within manufacturer's labeled limits, but post-dilate, you do gain radial strength and also as an additional benefit, you actually have a reduction in recoil as well. Uh, so that was it for my talk today. I, I think the high-level takeaways are, uh, always remember that in bifurcation stenting, you probably need larger overexpansion capability than uh, the vessel sizes you are treating. Um, overexpansion of stents, it increases strength, reduces recoil. Thin struts can be strong if you have a correct balance of strut geometry. And reducing stent recoil minimizes side branch expansion and optimizes clearing of the side cell. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim, for accepting to prepare this lecture in less than half a day. Uh, I thank uh, my co-chair, Professor Dangas, panelists, and uh, all the presenters and all of you. So we go to the next session, and I invite Professor Chevalier to take the position of chair.
Good morning. Uh, I'm Tan Virat from Emory University. My co-chairs are Mirat a staff from Military Hospital Jeddah and Francisco Berzata. So, uh, so uh, Berzata, without much ado, we have a little change in plan. We're going to ask Dr. Diaz-Sensko to give his first presentation since he has a flight to take. We'll start with him. Thank you. Fabrizio. Hello, thank you very much for inviting me there. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm presenting the impact on final kissing balloon above imaging of our patient treated with thin stents, that is the stents that we are currently used on a protected left main. These are my conflict of interest. So more or less when I laid the title, use of imaging, use of final killing balloon is all in the same tale. And we are here to try to understand the impact of everyday clinical practice. We perfectly know this is a nice registry from uh, an English group that use of imaging is very important. Most of these patients uh, did not perform IVUS and this registry allowed half of patients with bifurcations and use of imaging, this is, uh, these are adjusted data, did reduce maze and reduce mortality in these patients. And this is a brilliant meta-analysis from uh, Davide Capodanno. And uh, although uh, only, only few studies and few patients with left main disease, also in this meta-analysis, use of imaging reduce recurrent mice, reduce TUR and TLR, and consequently reduce maze. Regarding final kissing balloon, the data are much more contrasting. This is a sub-analysis from the COVID registry, COVID-2 registry, sorry, and they compare patients with final kissing balloon and also on unprotected left main. And you may see there the final kissing balloon reduced TLR, most, mostly TLR of main branch, and in few cases TLR on side branch and in both vessels. Another meta-analysis published on PROS1 including these studies and also more or less half of them only uh, reported data on left main and in this case uh, final kissing balloon inflation did not reduce risk of TLR so we have got contrasting data but we have to remember that most of these data were not performed on the stents that we currently use every day in our cat lab that is thin or ultra thin stents and we're also to remember that uh, in most of the study, use of imaging is not so frequent. These are not data from the Excel, from the Nobel randomized control trial, and also use of final kissing balloon inflation is not so often performed. We perform a registry, a RAIN registry, that is we roll all patients treated with thin stents on coronary bifurcations, both left vein and not left vein, and in this analysis that we recently published on American Journal of Cardiology, we analyze uh, 792 patients with unprotected left main stenosis treated with this stents. And after one year and a half, sorry, only 5.5 of these patients experienced TLR. These are the stents that we use on unprotected left main, that is Promus Premier, Ultimaster, Synergy, Science Alpine, and Resolutonics. And uh, this is the site of stenosis. That is, you may see there, that in most of the cases, stenosis occurred in the left main, and only in a few cases, stenosis occurred in the osseal cirque, only the osseal LAD. And uh, we compared patients with TLR regarding baseline features, and they were not so different. Most of them presented with NSTEMI or unstable angina but there were many differences regarding baseline features that you may see in patients experiencing TLR at higher rates of distal left main disease presented with a more severe disease, Medina 111, were less likely to be treated with a provisional approach and were less likely to use imaging. Use of imaging is in instances most of these patients perform IVUS, only very few patients perform OCT and also final kissing balloon were uh, less likely to be used in patients with TLR. And at butivariate analysis, provisional stenting, as largely described, final kissing balloon, and use of imaging reduce risk of TLR at a long follow-up. And uh, these data were also confirmed 
at Klappenmeier Survivor Analysis from TLR, that is the data from provisional versus two cent strategy, final key in balloon versus no final key in balloon, use of IVUS versus not use of IVUS. Then we try to understand if the benefits of final key in balloon was consensually presented also for provisional strategy or two cent strategy or not, and we demonstrate interesting, I think, that in provisional strategy, incidence of TLR did not change, while final key symbol reduced TLR for patients treated with two cent strategies. Differently, use of IVUS was consistent, the benefit of use of IVUS was consistent for provisional strategy, you may see here, air for two cent strategy. Then I discussed this data also with Francesco, with another paper we performed, and we started from another observation. This is a very elegant bench data from this uh, Japanese author, and they compare in a bench experiment short kissing balloon, you may see there, defined with an overlap of less than three millimeters versus long uh, kissing balloon with an overlap of the two balloons of more than three millimeters. And you may see there that the long uh, kissing balloon uh, creating uh, elliptical deformations of the coronaries leading to high she stress. So a reviewer, and also discussed with Francesco, asked us to perform a provisional, uh, to perform a propensity score comparing kissing balloon versus no kissing balloon and also trying to analyze short kissing balloon versus long kissing balloon. And we perform this data on all the rain registry, also Le unprotected left main and also non unprotected left main bifurcations, and the results were consistent that is, there is no difference in overall population between kissing balloon and non final kissing balloon. As stated before, the difference or the benefit is final kissing balloon is, also, is only presented for patients treated with two stand strategy, by, while is absent for patients treated with provisional strategy. And this is confirmed also at the uh, survival analysis. But then we try to understand. You may see there, there there is patient without kissing balloon, patient treated with uh, optimal kissing balloon, that is with short overlapping, and there you may see patient treated with long overlapping kissing balloon. This is overall population, and you may see the, the only benefit in reducing TLR is present in patient treated with short balloon overlap. And these are the data consistently for provisional and for two stand strategies. So I think that this is quite interesting from our point of view because it may suggest a way to perform in an optimal way the kissing balloon inflation. So in my, my conclusion, images reduce the stenosis in unprotected left main and should be exploited much more. That in all the registries, all the randomized control trial imaging is exploited in less than half of the cases. Final kissing balloon for sure reduces the stenosis in two cent strategy. And if you want to perform final kissing balloon in provisional strategy, you should perform with a short of a lap. Thanks a lot. Thank uh, I just have a question. The TLR, was it clinically driven or was it part of your protocol to... Clinically uh, driven. Only all, all clinically driven events. Not angiographic follow-up. So, uh, what about the pot in this uh, in this study? Yes, we got uh, pot was performed in uh, less than half of the patients, so um, fifty percent of the patients, and the benefit of kissing balloon, short kissing balloon, long kissing balloon did not differ among patients with and without pot. If there are no other questions, thank you. Thank you very much. Fabrizio. And we go on, thank you, <coughs> with, uh, with Professor Chevalier. He will uh, talk about uh, the bifurcation treatment in the real world inside from uh, Terumo registry. Thank you, Chairperson, ladies and gentlemen. See my potential conflict of interest. So the EUD master registry was uh, performed in uh, 376 uh, participating sites across uh, 50 countries. 
On the last uh, snapshot of the database was uh, about uh, 32,000 patients. And the target here is to capture the practice of bifurcation treatment in 4,077 patients with one year follow up. The platform is well known. It's an open cell uh, two link uh, design coated with a mix of uh, two polymers on Cyrolimus. Uh, using a gradient technology which is aimed at uh, minimizing the risk of polymer injury. Baseline characteristics are very classical. It's mainly a radial access uh, registry, as you can see. Imaging was used in 13% of the patients, mainly in Japan. Direct stenting in 30% of patients. Both vessels, main and side, have been treated in half of the patient and 22.6% received two stents. We have approximately half so-called true bifurcation, meaning a triple Medina 111 or 101 or 011 on other type of bifurcation, including uh, 001, which is in this uh, category. As you can see, kissing balloon was performed in 36% of patients, but in one big third of patients on the 22% of patients who receive two stents, it's a mix of uh, T-stenting, tap, crush, and culotte as the dominant uh, strategy for two stents. This is the global outcome of the cohort in bifurcation. You can see that the outcome is relatively good with 5% of TLF, 0.7% stent thrombosis, 2.9% of clinically driven TLR. But here, what I want to show you is this uh, propensity matching analysis regarding the impact of true versus non-true bifurcation, but also the impact of the technique, which is used, pot versus no pot, kissing versus no kiss, on one versus two stand, using matching on, of course, baseline characteristic of the patient, but also on procedural characteristic of the procedure. As you can see, true versus non-true bifurcation, there is no significant difference in terms of clinical event. And the TLF was exactly similar between the two groups. On the opposite, pot versus no pot, we have a strong benefit of pot in this cohort, as you can see, with a significant reduction of target SNMI, TLR, TLF, and stent thrombosis, which is divided by 10. Regarding KBT, no significant difference between uh, KBT and no KBT in this cohort. On one stand versus two stand, again, no significant difference with similar outcome between patients having one stand or two stand technique. If we go a little bit uh, deeper in the detail, we can compare patients with uh, stenting crossover. On patients with stenting crossover plus side branch ballooning with no KBT, on patients from this group having also stand crossover plus KBT. You can see that uh, stenting crossover alone with, compared with stenting crossover plus side branch ballooning with no kissing balloon, there is a significant difference in terms of target SLMI favoring simple crossover. And on the opposite, if we compare side branch ballooning alone versus KBT, there is a significant difference regarding target SLMI favoring kissing balloon technique. And if we go a little bit deeper in the relationship between one stand and two stand technique, pot versus no pot, and kissing versus no kissing, in one stand technique, pot is still very highly beneficial, as you can see reduction of TVMI, reduction of TLR, reduction of TLF, 3.3% versus 5.6, and stent thrombosis, which is 0 versus 1.1. Kissing versus no kissing balloon, it's neutral, no difference in clinical outcome in one stent technique. If you go to two stent technique, which is only 22% of the global cohort, pot versus no pot is beneficial with a difference in terms of TLF, 7.6 versus 4.3. And kissing versus no kissing balloon, kissing is beneficial with difference in terms of target SLMI, which is 1.2 versus 3.2, but the TLF was similar. So to conclude the result 
of this uh, snapshot of the database, the provisional sending is the dominant strategy worldwide. We have an excellent midterm outcome using the last generation DES, the Ultimaster in this uh, registry. POT is associated with very strong benefit, whatever the sending technique. And when a side branch intervention is done, KBT is associated with better outcome than sand branch ballooning alone. Two stand technique is no longer associated with worse outcome, no penalty for using two stands. And we have a, a benefit of KBT in this group of patients in terms of target based LMI. I thank you for your attention. And I, I understand the two stent strategy was only a small portion of the total cohort. Nevertheless, was there a difference between the type of strategy that was used or a trend that you noted? 22% uh, of patients with two stent, which is uh, 888 patients. So was there a trend depending on the two stent strategy that you noticed? So if did you notice worse with, for example, DK crush compared to we did not compare the different two stand technique because we think that the group of uh, will be too small to make a comparison. Are there other questions? So just uh, just one comment. Uh, by putting together these two important registry with a lot of patients uh, uh, taken into the real world, first of all, uh, we see that uh, POT is not systematically performed still. And uh, your data show convincingly that uh, there is a clinical impact for not using POT that is a simple technique. So it seems to be very effective and uh, it is uh, strange that uh, still people is not convinced but we should, uh, I mean, uh, forcefully push in order to have uh, the systematic adoption for it. The other signal which comes out from all the registry, including your one, is the fact that uh, Kissing balloon inflation may impact mainly strongly two stent strategies. Regarding uh, kissing balloon inflation into the uh, single stenting strategy, probably the quality of kissing comes out. Uh, Dr. Dascenzo data showed that uh, the overlaps may impact, and that there is, uh, I mean, a signal that uh, makes sense because it comes inside all the uh, bench test and fluidodynamic data if we perform a long overlap, if we do not perform the correct rewiring a kissing balloon inflation is somewhat unpredictable and may also be detrimental. And uh, uh, I think that all of this comes together and uh, thank you very much. One comment, which I think very important also is that the fact that if you open the side branch, uh, you should do a kiss after that, and it's clearly demonstrated in this uh, registry. Yes. Last, last point. Uh, one other thing was pot site pot looked in this series of patients that you evaluated. No, because I think uh, when we started this registry, the pot site pot <laughs> approach was not so promoted, so we captured the practice like it was approximately two years ago. Thank you. So uh, the next speaker, Dr. Regatelli, uh, nano crush for left main stenting. Thank you so much for the kind invitation. Don't don't focus too much on the name. It's just a name. It's just because in Italian sounds well to my mind. But uh, uh, we we came with this uh, idea in uh, 2014. And uh, uh, for uh, the aim was uh, to crush uh, very little and uh, balloon crush very little and using only uh, uh, ultra thin uh, stent strut, uh, strut stent uh, uh, technology. Uh, we applied uh, earlier in the shock patient because it was very fast and uh, 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 to do. And then we published a series of, uh, of uh, um, papers and uh, uh, in the same time, we uh, performed some uh, uh, bench study and some uh, um, flow dynamic study. The steps are very quick and very fast. Don't focus it to the name. I have a lot of discussion with friends here and in front of the beer, and I completely agree that probably we can even call it in, in another way because it's a balloon crash or only 
possibly one ring or one millimeter at maximum, so we can call even uh, modified the stand or whatever. And uh, wiring, uh, predilation both branches, a standing side branch with a very little protrusion using only ultra thin uh, strut stands, um, crashing with the balloon and uh, a standing main vessel, uh, re a port, first port, rewiring, a snuggle kissing, not full kissing, and the final port. That are the steps. And uh, to go on, um, we, uh, that's a, some figure about uh, the um, band study, and uh, I perform just to see if uh, the, the stents are posed like was in my mind before. And it is the case. We do, we do also some. We did also some angio, angioscopy study in the bench model, and also some uh, flow dynamic study that show us that uh, the results uh, at the end, if everything was well, is uh, like uh, more or less uh, uh, like uh, a crossover and much better. I have another picture here for uh, shortening the, the speech, but uh, even even better than Coulart and decay crash. Uh, difference with the other techniques are uh, crossover obviously as a port uh, using only one stent in a culotte is a double stent technique and require final kissing, mini crush, decay crush is a stent crush, final kissing demanding double kissing for decay crush for our so-called nano crush is uh, mandatory to use stra uh, strut stents and less than 80 micron and uh, to use a double port. This is some uh, demography and clinic in brief, just because we compare this first series of patients with uh, uh, the historical uh, uh, series of patients in our lab uh, uh, using other techniques. And uh, you see that uh, uh, the amount of uh, probably risk of other is uh, uh, much more in, fa in uh, uh, um, favor of uh, nano crash in respect to uh, uh, the other techniques. Um, everything is. Uh, pretty comparable regarding the angiographic characteristics of the patients. This is the presentation, and you see that uh, STEMI was one of the indications, not a prospective study, it's just a, a real practice. And uh, for about uh, the uh, uh, people who underwent uh, the so-called nano crash, just focus on the amount of calcification, this is pretty high, and the chronic total occlusion also, and uh, you see uh, in the bottom the Sinta score that is pretty high. Uh, I don't know if everything is moved, but this is a, a STEMI patient uh, with, a, with a, a, a complex left main and a clue the circ. Uh, just keep it because the movie are not doing very well. This is another uh, um, case with non STEMI and uh, um, renal kidney failure is a female, and you see there is a, there is a, a complex left main bifurcation disease with subocluder circ occluded LAD. And uh, following the same steps I showed you before, we achieve a very good result. And in another case, just to see to, to show you that the people enrolled that are really uh, sick people. Um, this is a, a, um, uh, not so easy to see on angiography, but easily seen to uh, by eye, which is very complex, a uh, very high calcified left main bifurcation disease. So uh, we prepare with rota, and the final result is uh, in the panel C, and you see that everything seems to uh, work well. Um, the outcomes, uh, DUR and TLR, were in favor. Uh, much in favor of uh, uh, our technique compared to the others. And uh, the three years survival was a very, um, sorry, it's a three years, it's a one year survival. It was in, in favor of nano crash. Now we have uh, 250 people, uh, patients uh, enrolling in uh, multicenter registry, left main, unprotect, unprotected left main at three years of follow up, and the result are the same, uh, exactly the same. Uh, about uh, the nano crash alone, you see that uh, uh, the TVR, TLR, and community survival are very nice, and uh, 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 we think to have done a good job with the 
kind of technique, but I, again, don't focus too much on the name. I, I'm sure that I'm not inventing nothing new, probably just uh, uh, standardized design, something that uh, everyone in the catalog try more or less to do. Uh, um, and that is to use uh, uh, the, the less amount of crushing possible and uh, possibly to, uh, to use only uh, very ultra thin sand strut. So in conclusion, narrow crush stenting in left main shoved improved long time outcomes with low TF, low mortality, zero thrombosis compared to other double stenting technique, at least in our lab. Narrow crash stenting in left main provided easy and faster revascularization. We don't pay too much attention. It didn't uh, show you too much, but uh, the X-ray exposure was a one f uh, was a 50 percent and then uh, a cool out, and the low contrast dose is about 120 uh, uh, cc on contrast on a mean, so very reasonable, and uh, I think it. it can be an alternative to decay crush or other techniques in complex left main bifurcation disease. Thank you. Thank you. Um, always this question about the precision of yeah. coverage at the ostal side, Brad, because you really want to cover the carina. Yeah. How From can you be absolutely sure? Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, one I, millimeter, two millimeters, five. I mean, how can you? Yeah, be sure that, that, that's this? another that's another point that, that we discuss in front of beer mo most of, most of the time around the world. And uh, I agree that uh, you cannot be sure 100 percent that you are crushing only one ring or at, at maximum one one millimeter. But I mean, attemptatively, the technique implies that you crush at least uh, um, at maximum one millimeter. Uh, the good thing is that uh, depending on the uh, on the angles, uh, you don't necessarily crush one millimeter protrusion uh, uh, inside the left main because uh, it, uh, uh, the portion of the carina is covered by the, the side branch stent, but the contralateral portion, the opposite wall of the carina of the, the roof of the ostium is covered by the left main stent. Uh, when you do the part. So the good thing is that we are, you should not be necessarily crushing uh, two millimeter, one millimeter inside the left main. Just just the uh, very small portion, the ring of the side branch stent, and then the rest of the, uh, uh, the opposite wall of the carina is covered by the main stent uh, uh, strut protruding into the side branch. But the other thing is the ultra thin struts are very difficult to see. Yeah, when, when uh, usually uh, we you can do with um, a stand booth. Uh, usually I do with uh, just uh, hyper magnification of the fluoroscopy field. It takes three three seconds, and the fluoroscopy dose is completely the same uh, that uh, with other techniques. So we don't increase too much the the uh, dose of uh, exposure. So, Gianluca, I want to just, just discuss a bit uh, the name and uh, yeah. the, uh, uh, the, case, the simulated case you showed. So, what, I, what I've seen on the, on the simulation, that there was no lateral crush, which is the definition of the crush. When you re-enter yeah, to, I, I when you re -enter to the side branch in a crush, you enter in a lateral cell, not in the lumen of the stent. Yeah. So, what you got here is probably a, a modified T. Some, some uh, exactly. Is some uh, concertina crushing that was uh, telling uh, John Armiston concertina. So it's a longitudinal crush of the side branch, which is side branch edge, which is slightly protruding. And when you re-enter, you re-enter in the distal lumen of the stent. And of course, it looks like very much to what described Antonio Colombo a long time ago, which is modified T. And unfortunately, uh, Francesco removed it from the new classification. So. It's, it, it, for me, there is a difference in essence. This is subtle, but the difference in essence compared with the crushing, which is yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Which, uh, we discussed with of crushing laterally the stand, which is not the same thing. We discussed with Mother Shaiban. Uh, so it's just for uh, nosology. And yeah, two, two minutes ago, outside the smoky cigar. So <laughs> we can we can call a uh, reverse and modify T. It's just because nano crush in my mind sounds very. Very uh, beautiful in Italy, so it's called nano crash. But I mean, whatever you want is good. Uh, so, uh, when 
Yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. When we perform another uh, crash, uh, when uh, the main main vessel standing is finished, when we we should uh, recross a uh, certain uh, Do you uh, advise recross the stand strap from the distal or middle or proximal proximal side? Oh, is that a good question? Uh, in real practice, it's very difficult to me to be sure that you cross uh, uh, the exact cell you want to cross. To cross, because uh, I mean, uh, you know about uh, everything uh, related to OCT guided uh, uh, guided um, rewiring. Uh, we don't use uh, OCT; we use IVUS, so it's very difficult. Usually, tentatively, is to cross uh, the, the not the distal but the proximal. Uh, the, the second question is uh, actually the even though uh, we uh, you perform a, a minimal crash, yeah. but there is actually some stand crash uh, at the proximal end of the second first stand. So when we recross re the main main vessels uh, stand strap, do you worry about uh, the wire go outside of the stand of the second first? We, we perform. More, I, I told you we perform at uh, 250 now patient, and it never happened to me to go out abluminal. So. I don't know, not because I'm so good, but just for, because uh, you crash a very little, so uh, f uh, we use a very high pressure inflation when, when we, we do port, when we do snuggle kissing, so the potential for going up luminal in my, in my view is limited, but it's a good point. Thank you very much, we need to move on. So uh, Dr. Derrimer will be the next presenter of the Cabriolist Registry. Preliminary clinical data and repot technique. Ah, okay, thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the invitation to present the preliminary, preliminary results of the Cabriolet registry. Uh, Cabriolet is a registry dedicated to evaluate the uh, clinical benefits or not of, uh, of the report. As you know, report is a pure uh, sequential technique <clears throat> in three steps. Firstly, uh, an initial port, then a, a thigh branch inflation alone, and to conclude, a final port. The concept of the, the report was described by Gérard Finet five years ago in the uh, EBC. And to uh, evaluate uh, uh, the result of the report, we decide to organize a step-by-step -step validation or a stage-by-stage -stage validation. That's why, firstly, we uh, perform many uh, experimental uh, studies on the fractal benches, uh, which demonstrated that uh, the report finally obtains a, a better mechanical result compared to all uh, juxtaposition uh, techniques. These uh, uh, good uh, mechanical results uh, uh, were confirmed in a uh, uh, clinical, clinical OCT uh, uh, study. And so the last step or last stage of the, the validation uh, was probably the realization of a large uh, clinical registry. That's why we organize uh, Cabriolet, which is a, a multicenter uh, registry with the objective to include 500 bifurcation. The criteria to include the bifurcation was very uh, easy. It was uh, all bifurcation accessible to a provisional standing strategy and uh, uh, with the uh, advice to the operator to realize a complete report, that means the three steps of the reports. All the other uh, procedural characteristics uh, remain at the uh, uh, operator's discretion. Uh, the uh, clinical follow-up uh, follow, follow expected was uh, one year. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the uh, core lab validation and the uh, follow-up uh, are, are still incomplete, so uh, I'm sorry, I will present you, you only uh, uh, preliminary data. So, uh, concerning the initial data, around uh, 400 patients, the uh, population included in Cabriolet is a classic population included in, uh, in, uh, in, in international cardiology studies, that means more men and uh, an, uh, a middle age around 65 years old. We included 26% uh, 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 of uh, uh, diabetes, and more of these uh, patients were symptomatic at the admission, and even in, uh, in one third was uh, in uh, an unstable uh, clinical state at the admission. We included in uh, Cabriolet uh, around one third of uh, uh, left main, and uh, all patients uh, in all patients, the report uh, uh, was complete. That means the three steps as expected. 
and most of these uh, reports uh, were realized uh, by radial access. Uh, the Truby bifurcation uh, was around 40% uh, of the, the old bifurcation, and the mid uh, bifurcation on angle in the arena was at uh, 70 uh, degrees. Uh, one uh, surprising point is uh, the rate of uh, uh, endovascular imaging, only 20%, obviously greater in case of left main, uh, and we can maybe discuss uh, this point after. Uh, knowing the uh, fractal geometry and the, the finello, uh, uh, we uh, confirm this, uh, this fractal geometry without surprise, and uh, as we uh, observe a significant stepwise, especially concerning the left main, around one millimeter between the proximal and distal uh, diameters, and around 0 0.6 millimeter uh, for the other bifurcation. As uh, I, um, I told you, uh, the, uh, all the procedural characteristics was at the discretion of the operator, and so uh, 50 in 50% of the case, a genuine wire was uh, performed. Uh, also, 60% uh, of compliant balloon uh, was uh, selected for, for the realized uh, each spot. So this is the, the first uh, results, the angiographic result uh, after the, the revascularization. And uh, we can see that uh, report uh, obtained a uh, really good uh, angiographic result with a very high rate of uh, TME flow uh, in the main branch and in the cell branch for uh, a low rate of complication in the cell branch, only 5% of uh, significant dissection and uh, a pretty uh, the same rate of uh, stenosis greater than 70%. The operator decides in the half of the case uh, to uh, realize a, a bailout with an additional stent in the, in the side branch. This is the, the main result, the clinical results, and uh, uh, this time it's only on 300 uh, patients. And you can see that the, the main criteria was the uh, target vessel fail failure, that means the addition of myocardial death, uh, stent thrombosis, myocardial infarction, and target vessel uh, revascularization. And the TVF uh, for the total population is very low, only 2% of the, of the population at one year. It's uh, confirmed by a low myocardial death, no uh, stent thrombosis, and uh, only 2% uh, of uh, uh, revascularization in all patients. All MACE, uh, independently of the uh, location of the the event uh, represented uh, represents uh, four percent of our population. So, uh, despite the, uh, the incomplete uh, data, we can conclude that the report uh, seems to be a, a safe and easy uh, technique uh, available in a large range of uh, bifurcation, uh, especially available in uh, life main. This is a pure sequential provisional stenting uh, developed uh, to uh, perfectly. Uh, respect or to try to perfectly respect the uh, physiological, physiological fractal geometry as confirmed by the uh, very good uh, initial angiographic uh, results. This, uh, angi this good angiographic results are um, confirmed, secondly, confirmed by an excellent clinical result at one year with only 2% of uh, TVF. Obviously, we need to, uh, to, f to finish uh, the analysis uh, and the, the, the end of the inclusion was in May, so we expected uh, a, a final uh, uh, a complete result in the next year, in the mid of the, um, the 2020, and uh, I hope to present you uh, the complete results next year. We, uh, in front of uh, this very, very good result, we, uh, we think that we can already to think about the, the next step. And uh, the next step will be probably uh, the, uh, the RCT because we need to confirm uh, these benefits or not. But uh, uh, we, uh, we are happy to be in this uh, EBC and to enjoy this uh, great meeting to discuss about uh, this RCT, especially concerning uh, which comparison with the report, uh, which criteria. And uh, uh, we, are, we are happy to discuss with you if you are interested. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Francois. Um, just, just a comment. Um, you, you show us that uh, in your primary results, there is a difference between the left main and the non length main in terms of uh, TVF. Um, I, I think uh, I'm convinced that it's a very nice uh, 
uh, technique except for the left main, I think. Thank you for the beginning of the question. I disagree with uh, the end. Um, it's true that uh, it, it's different. Uh, firstly, left main, the, the prognosis of the left main is uh, always worse, but uh, I think that it's because I try to, to uh, I, um, I calculate, I, I, sorry, I classify the event according to the target vessel failure. The vessels, that means that some of the events in the left main are a mid cirque very, very far of the bifurcation. But I know that according to the uh, hemodynamics, the bifurcation can modify the, the mid cirque. But if you take a proximal lesion like the left main, the uh, territory, the, the coronary territory will be uh, bigger. So you have a higher risk to, in case of revascularization, independently of the bifurcation, you can uh, easily add this uh, revascularization in the TVF and not TLF. Uh, it's one of the explanations. I have two cases like this, so it probably changed the, the percentage, but it's just preliminary. Yeah, uh, uh, did you standardize a kind of uh, pot the, regarding the uh, pressure you reach, the site of the pot in most of the cases you, you have done? No, the pot for the operator? Yeah, I mean, did you standardize the technique of the pot? I mean, the the pressure you reach it uh -huh. and the exact site and in these 250 cases. Okay. Um, we try to to take the pressure of its procedure, but it's too complex and the operator most of the time forget. But in fact, we don't really care about the pressure of the balloon. It's not the key point. The key point is the diameter because you want to push your stent until the vessel to correct the, the malaposition, the proximal malaposition. And if you take a balloon at three millimeters at 40 atmosphere, the diameter will be different uh, than uh, a 4.0 uh, balloon at 10 atmosphere. So the objective is to reach the good balloon at the good pressure. And that's why we, I, I have no time to discuss that, but I, uh, in the protocol, we advise a compliant balloon because a compliant balloon, due to the mechanical properties of the balloon, you have a range of diameter at increasing pressure greater than a non-compliant balloon. And you have a range around 20% of diameter uh, compared to less than 10% with a non-compliant balloon. So in left main, it's difficult to get a uh, compliant balloon at the, the, the good diameter, so it's okay to use a non-compliant balloon, but the real advice is to use a compliant balloon for other lesion, all lesions as you can, and the pressure is just the pressure needed to reach the artery to, to push the stent until the, 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 the vessel. Gérard Finet uh, will uh, finalize uh, a very nice paper experimentation to analyze the mechanical properties of the balloon and it, it clearly shows that the, the force to push, just push the stent is very low, around 1, 1.5 atmosphere. So you don't need a force, you need to move the stent. So you need to, uh, to get the balloon um, which offers the larger range of diameter to, it's like um, the comparison in, in French, I don't, I don't know it in English, but in French we say that it's like the haute couture and prêt-à-porter. That means you are, we try to uh, take the stent, the balloon will give you the better, um, uh, the better, ac yeah, and accuracy, not accuracy, but to be closer to, the, to your uh, target in terms of diameter. Okay, thank you. I think that uh, all of this, uh, however, should be put uh, into the perspective of uh, an undiseased left main uh, or proximal main vessel, because as soon as you have the plaque, it's a different story. You should scaffold with your balloon also the plaque, not only the stent struts. Yeah. And uh, just a small comment, because I mean, w uh, in the interest of time, I, I uh, captured that the jailed guide wire were used in half of the patients, something like that. Sorry. 50. 50%. Yes, if it, in fact, so if is this part of your technique or does it mean just that uh, no. they are false bifurcations? No. It, it was a center uh, training, so we have five, uh, five really uh, center, and uh, two of them uh, included, uh, systematically realized a jailing wire and three other not, so it's just uh, a local practice, not, uh, absolutely not uh, uh, okay. in correlation with the anatomy. Or okay, thank you very much. 
So uh, next speaker will be Dr. Zavik, and he will uh, report on an important uh, recent study, twilight study, ticagrelor with uh, or without aspirin in high-risk patients after PCI. Thank you very much, uh, chairs, colleagues. Um, again, pleasure to be here at uh, EBC, and uh, it was a pleasure and privilege to be associated with the Twilight Trial, um, which I think has quite a bit of relevance to those of us who do bifurcation, complex bifurcation lesions potentially in high-risk patients. So this was the uh, presentation of Roxana Moran at uh, the recent uh, TCT meeting um, in uh, San Francisco. Uh, the sponsor was the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Uh, the study was funded by AstraZeneca. And uh, the background basically is that the there's a need to balance the ischemic and bleeding complications for uh, post-PCI. And the idea was the, the addressing the clinical imperatives of lowering bleeding while preserving ischemic benefit requires therapeutic strategies that decouple thrombotic and hemorrhagic risk. And that reducing the duration of aspirin after PCI may allow potentially for prolonged use of potent P2Y12 inhibitors while avoiding aspirin-related bleeding risk. So the hypothesis of the TWILIGHT trial was that in patients undergoing PCI who are at high risk for ischemic or hemorrhagic complications and who have completed a three-month course of dual antiplatelet therapy with ticagrelor and aspirin, continued treatment with ticagrelor monotherapy would be superior to ticagrelor plus aspirin with respect to clinically relevant bleeding and would not lead to ischemic harm. <coughs> so the primary objective was to determine the impact of SAPT, that is with ticagrelor monotherapy versus DAPT, ticagrelor and aspirin, for 12 months in reducing clinically relevant bleeding BARC 2, 3, or 5 among high-risk patients who have undergone successful PCI. The secondary objective was to determine if the impact of this strategy, SAPT versus DAPT, ticagrelor versus ticagrelor and aspirin, for 12 months on major ischemic adverse events uh, that is all-cause death, non-fatal MI, or stroke among high-risk patients who have undergone successful PCI. So the TWILIGHT was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial conducted in 187 sites across 11 countries, uh, huge participation from Europe, and I'll show these uh, in the next slide. Patients undergoing successful PCI with at least one locally approved drug eluting stent whom the treating clinician intended to discharge onto Cagalor plus aspirin were eligible to participate. And the trial inclusion required the presence of at least one additional clinical and angiographic feature associated with a high risk of ischemic or bleeding events. So these are the criteria. So remember, you had to have at least one in each category, uh, age greater than uh, or equal to 65, female gender, troponin positive ACS, established vascular disease, diabetes, uh, CKD. So one of those plus one angiographic criterion, multivessel uh, coronary artery disease, target lesion requiring total stent length more than 30 millimeters thrombotic target lesion, bifurcation lesion, uh, a true bifurcation lesion requiring uh, at least uh, two stents, left main or proximal LAD, and calcified target lesion requiring atherectomy. So again, at least one of these. Um, fairly standard occlusion criteria for the sake of time, I won't list these verbally. Uh, Roxana Moran was the PI, Usman Babur was the um, chair of the core clinical coordinating center number of people including ones in this room had uh, major involvement in this study it was, it was really a huge effort so the basic design was that uh, after an enrollment period of three months in high-risk patients as i had defined which was 9006 patients who were enrolled um, patients were then randomized those who continued who were able to continue on dual antiplatelet therapy with ticagrelor and aspirin were randomized to a 12-month period 
of ticagrelor and aspirin or ticagrelor and placebo. There was a subsequent three-month observation period of standard of care. Um, the primary endpoint was BARC 2, 3, or 5 bleeding between 0 and 12 months after randomization. And the key secondary endpoint was an ischemic one, that is non-fatal MI, stroke, or all-cause death between 0 and 12 months again after randomization. Um, the sample size basically was chosen to detect relative reduction of at least 28% with ticagrelor monotherapy uh, with type 1 error of uh, 5%. Assuming a one-year rate of 8% for the key secondary endpoint, a sample size of 8,200 would provide 80% power also to exclude an absolute non-inferiority margin of 1.6% with a type 1 error of 2.5%. Uh, An enrolled cohort of 9,000 was chosen to accommodate approximately 10% rate of randomization ineligibility. I won't go through these details, but again, need to point out, especially the European, a huge participation here, um, Poland, Germany, UK, Spain, Italy, Austria, uh, going over to, uh, to Israel in this region. Um, the largest number of enrolled were in, in USA. Uh, China was, in fact, the second highest enrolling country, but great participation from all the European countries that I had mentioned here. Uh, randomized patients, so again, there were enrolled patients and randomized patients, again, significant uh, participation uh, in Europe, the, the top three, especially Poland, Italy, uh, uh, United Kingdom, uh, huge participation here, so many thanks again. Um, again, just to point out the Europeans here, since we're at the European Bifurcation Club meeting, uh, Professor Carlo Brigori um, uh, did a, a tremendous job in enrolling on Dr. Wojciech Fiel uh, from Poland as well. And of course, uh, huge, as you can see, Chinese, US, and some uh, large Canadian participation as well. So of the 9,006 uh, patients enrolled, um, 7,019 were randomized to ticagrelor placebo or ticagrelor aspirin. Uh, so on the right side, important to understand why patients were not randomized who had been enrolled. So the majority, in fact, were, was for non-adherence to dual antiplatelet therapy, uh, consent withdrawal in 267, adverse events, uh, 243, of the 9,006 uh, were not enrolled because they had adverse events in those first three months, death, MI, or stroke, any revascularization, or a significant bleed. So 99.7 uh, follow-up, uh, so, so tremendous uh, follow-up rate uh, in this study in both arms. Uh, adherence to study medication you can see here quite uh, high this, at six month follow-up and at 12 month follow-up uh, to ticagrelor placebo, ticagrelor and aspirin. Fairly standard, though higher risk population, so uh, more than a third were diabetics, which is higher than you see in a lot of uh, PCI studies. Um, CKD, uh, almost 17% of patients had CKD. Um, prior PCI, as you can see, almost uh, over 40% prior cabbage, 10% uh, uh, previous major bleed in a very small uh, proportion of patients. Um, again, just to magnify these, so baseline procedural characteristics, um, almost three quarters were done by radial access, indicating that uh, the the strong presence of non-US participation, uh, obviously. Um, Multivessel CAD in almost two-thirds. So just to amplify these, thrombus in 10%, calcification in 14, any bifurcation in 12. So there may be potential for some subgroup analysis here that's relevant uh, in particular to this, to, to our group. And total stent length was, over, was 40 millimeters in both groups. So the primary endpoint, the BARC 2, 3, or 5 bleeding was observed in 7.1%. 
of those with ticagalor and aspirin, and 4.0% in those with ticagalor and placebo. Highly statistically significant, 44% reduction in the hazard ratio of, of the primary event. Um, in terms of even more severe, three or five bleeding, the intention to treat cohort 2% versus 1.0%, again, highly statistically significant, 51% reduction in the hazard ratio of, of this event. And any other uh, pre-specified bleeding endpoints, three or five, Timmy major, gusto moderate or severe, um, highly significant for, for all of these in terms of the reduction of the bleeding risk with ticagalor monotherapy versus ticagalor and aspirin after the three month of dual therapy at zero to 12 months. So the key secondary endpoint now, which was death, MI or stroke, this is in the per protocol population, so the, popula the people who actually received the therapy, uh, ticagalor and ASA 3.9% versus placebo and ticagalor 3.9%, uh, so no difference at all, and, and no difference really in any of the other pre-specified ischemic endpoints in the per protocol cohort, CV death, MI, or ischemic uh, stroke. Uh, all cause death, uh, any myocardial infarction, any stroke, um, or stent thrombosis. As you can see, there are no significant differences in any of these uh, endpoints. Um, this is just the numerical representation of that in tabular form. Uh, again, showing what I had just stated in the previous uh, slide. Subgroup analysis for the primary endpoint and the intention to treat cohort Again, there are no uh, significant uh, differences or outliers in terms of any subgroups, age less than 65 versus 65 or older, uh, sex, uh, diabetes, uh, region of enrollment. Uh, all of these subgroups, basically the, the trends were the same or the direction of, of benefit was the same uh, between ticagalor monotherapy or ticagalor and aspirin. Um, ACS, the same, that's why that was highlighted. There was actually a separate presentation, which I won't have time to deal with, uh, by Usman Osman um, Babar, uh, dealing with the ACS population itself, which showed very similar results. So this is a landmark analysis for the primary endpoint from the point of randomization, showing again 7.1% versus 4% monotherapy versus dual therapy. And this is the observational period afterwards on uh, standard therapy. Again, no difference at that point. This is after the randomized period. And the landmark analysis for the key secondary endpoints of death, MI, or stroke. Again, absolutely no difference. And the observational three-month period thereafter. Okay, so the limitations of this trial include the fact that all patients um, it may, this may not be generalizable to all patients undergoing PCI given the requirement in this trial for both high-risk clinical and angiographic features and patients receiving background therapy with other P2Y12 inhibitors. The observed treatment effects do not apply to all enrolled participants, but rather to those patients who were able to take at least the three months of therapy and did not have an event or were able to tolerate the medications of dual antiplate therapy without any major, major adverse events. There was also a lower than expected incidence of the composite endpoint, MI or stroke. That may have biased these results for the key secondary endpoint towards the null hypothesis. And the lack of power to de detect differences in the risk of important yet rare clinical events such as stent thrombosis and stroke. So in conclusion, in high-risk patients who underwent PCI and were treated with ticagalor, an aspirin for three months without any major adverse bleeding or ischemic events, an antiplatelet strategy of continuing to Caglor monotherapy resulted in substantially less bleeding than to Caglor plus aspirin without increasing ischemic events over a period of one year. And the study was published simultaneously in New England Journal is available there. And uh, of course, the Twilight investigators would like to thank everybody, including uh, the many people in this room who contributed uh, to this effort. 
and uh, there's a huge group of collaborators uh, that uh, participate in this, I think, a very important landmark study. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, since uh, I mean, we are late, just one question by Professor Sarouis. Yeah, I mean, uh, Vlad, it was a very good presentation. Uh, one, one of the concerns that I have with uh, Roxanne is that uh, if you look at the ischemic stroke, you have a 16 and 8, that's an hazard ratio of 2, yeah. uh, with a p-value of 0 0.1. And we have done the exercise to look at the twilight-like in the global, lo uh, global leaders, and we found 16 and 8 also with a hazard ratio. So ischemic stroke is something that we have to pay attention because, of course, with Roxanne, we are going to pull the data together. And I guess that when you have two times an hazard ratio of two, you will, something will emerge. And recently, what has been uh, described in the literature is the CRP, which is the collagen reactive peptide. And the collagen reactive peptide is something which is only blocked by aspirin and has some impact on the cerebral circulation. So I don't know if we have, uh, it's a small signal that maybe we have to follow in the uh, future study every time that we reduce the uh, aspirin in a drastic way on the uh, uh, cerebral stroke. Yeah, I think that, Patrick, that's a point well taken um, and acknowledged really as a limitation that this was a, a very low frequency event and that we may have missed a significant impact. I think having said that, um, it being a low frequency effect, uh, you know, even 0.5% uh, incidence of stroke, any stroke, and not just ischemic, but, but I guess any stroke is, is small relative to what you're seeing as a decrease in, in other uh, bleeding uh, complications and um, wh which are important as well, which obviously will be important. Bleeding complications do affect outcome long term. So, I, but, but that's a point well taken and I think we'd look forward to, to your combined analysis. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I think uh, we'll move on to the keynote lecture, Lessons Learned from COBA Studies 2004 to 2019. Dr. Koo, please. So, anyway, thank you very much, and it's always my great honor and pleasure to be the part of the European Bifurcation Club meeting. So I'm going to talk about the COBIS trial, which started with the enrollment of the patient in 2004, and we are in uh, 2019 with the five-year follow-up of the last enrollment patients who were treated with the uh, second-generation drug eluting stent for the bifurcation lesion. So it's good to see that the, with the 10-year struggle, so through the COBIS-1 and COBIS-2 registry, there were several uh, studies to uh, understand and investigate these clinically relevant issues with the more than uh, 30 uh, papers. But the primary endpoint for this struggle and studies and, and, and uh, trials is to improve the outcome. And in, in that perspective, it's very nice to see that comparing with the COBIS-1 and COBIS-2 outcome, COBIS-3 outcome showed uh, less event rate compared to uh, the previous trial. So if you see the breakdown, so in left main, there was a decrease in uh, target lesion failure by 30%, and in non-left main, there was a decrease in target uh, lesion failure rate by as much as 50%. So it will be interesting what makes this kind of difference. So let me start with the excess and some stent issues. So you've seen uh, this change tr in trends of the excess site from Dr. Do's presentation. So at 2014, transradial PCI, uh, bifurcation PCI is more common 
than the transfemoral, and we now know that the, in 2019, more than 70% of trans, uh, uh, bifurcation PCR is done the radio. So what's the difference? We know that the, this is the study from COVID-2 registry, uh, divided the patients in left main PCI transradial versus transfemoral, so that the, there was a slight uh, decrease in MACE. I think it's probably due to the selection bias, but we know for sure that the transradial is associated with the less risk of bleeding, whatever major or minor, so that the, uh, with this trend, with the more transradial, so we are uh, having, making our patients more safer. So this is a data from COBIS-2 registry, non-left main, left main. We know that the two stenting is in general worse than one stenting strategy. So this is the reason why that the provisional strategy is still the standard approach for patients with bifurcation lesion. And this is the, also the reason why we're working harder to make this gap narrower to have a better outcome with two stenting it a properly selected patient. For that, we may first consider about the better stents. We know very well that the second generation drug eluting stent is far better than first generation stent. So this is data from uh, pooled bifurcation cohort. Most of patients were derived from the uh, COBIS registry. First generation stent, two stent is far worse than one stent. But it's very good to see that the outcome of the second generation drug eluting stents so absolute event rates has become better, lower than previous study, and it's good to see that the, even after two stenting, the outcome is quite similar in second generation. So that the, when we apply the second generation nowadays, we are doing a better work for the patient. Then the question is whether there will be difference among second generation drug eluting stents. So for that, we divided the patients who finished with the uh, single stent, uh, single type stent, and the uh, BES stent, ZES, and platinum chromium stent, and cobalt chromium stent, and we tried one to see whether there's a difference among these uh, different characteristic stents. So, in side branch, no treatment group, there was no difference among those uh, four groups, and when we divide the uh, uh, the stents into the two connector type and three connector type, there was no difference. So in a, another group with the side brain treatment, you can see some difference. So that the BES is numerically worse than the other stents, but there was no statistically significant difference. And in, on the right lower panel, comparison with the three connector, uh, two connector, three connector seems to be worse numerically, but still there's no statistically significant difference. So the bottom line is, with the current generation drug eluting stents, all are working very well, and we may, find, we may need to do a further study. Then the next question may be the stent strategy. So all stents are good, so what will be the good strategy? We know that it's very difficult to compare the benefit or the outcome of different strategy from this different studies. So these are the four different studies. If you simply focus on the outcome of the culotte, some studies 6.7%, some 16 some say 10 So it should be uh, uh, compared in one single study. So in that perspective, it's good to review the COVID-2 data. So in around 800 patients with two-stent technique, the patients were divided into the side branch first, mostly crush technique, and main branch first, mostly tap technique. So that the after pro propensity, after PS matching, side branch first, versus main branch first was compared, which is a, a, a practically comparison between the crush and tap. So here is the outcome at three years, comparison, comparison of the crush and tap, the outcome is exactly the same. So there may be no difference in, in different stent, uh, stent strategy. So you may also be wondered about the uh, COVID-3 recent data. So it's so stenting has become less and less, especially for left main in Korean uh, situation. So in COVID-3, most were treated with one stenting, and 18.2% uh, of patients were treated by two stenting. And the breakdown of stent strategy is crush is 54%, followed by T-stenting. And European may be a little bit disappointed this trend, so that kilot is only 6.8%. So we maybe Dr. Colombo have too much influence in our society. 
So what can be the outcome of these different technologies, crush, tea, kill out, kissing, in terms of five-year outcome, there was no difference. So I think that, as it is frequently said, the best one is the one which you are most familiar with. But one thing very interesting data or the analysis results from the COBIS-2 data is that the comparison with the sideburn first strategy and membrane first strategy, you can find some interaction so that when you zoom that kind of results, you see that it's interesting that the, according to the severity of main branch in terms of both percent diameter stenosis and lesion length, and also according to the side branch stenosis severity, trends were different. So in lesions with the more severe main branch, main branch severity, main branch, uh, main, br uh, main branch first approach was better, and in lesions with the higher stenosis severity in side branch, side branch first strategy was better. So it makes sense. So that the more severe lesion first may be a, a reasonable option when treating with the patient requiring systematic two stenting. So then let's think about the uh, technique issue. So it's very interesting to see that the role of KISS for one stent technique. So there can be some good KISS, bad KISS, or the neutral KISS. And it's also very interesting to see that the, the data from COBIS-1 and COBIS-2 is contradictory. So similar operator, all Korean patients, why there's a big difference? Two times worse in COBIS-1 and two times better in COBIS-2. So this question may be answered by this observation of this QCA data. So final kissing balloon group, so this is a PSM, so that even before uh, propensity score matching or not, there was no difference before kissing in terms of main vessel, lumen area, and uh, lumen diameter, and side branch lumen diameter. But after kissing, there was a change in the whole main vessel stent segment and side branch uh, osteo part. So it is interesting that the, in the kissing group, proxima segment, middle segment, distal segment all became better with the kissing and the proxima segment, there was an increase in almost a 10% in diameter. So this was translated into the less event rate in main vessel. So I think this represents that the pot is good, kissing can be good, but the determinants of the outcome is the final lumen diameter or area we achieve in the main vessel. So the good kiss may be gentle kiss for mainly main branch or main branch stent segment with some influence in the side branch. And we know that the use of uh, non-compliant balloon is strongly recommended by the uh, EBC guideline when the patient were divided into the non-compliant balloon uses and compliant balloon uses in the procedure outcome non-compliant balloon uh, usage was uh, better, and even in the long-term outcome, there was a significant improvement in outcome and better outcome in patients who were treated with the non-compliant balloon. So let's move on to this some um, concept so that the previous Dr. Hernandez talk, uh, asked about this question. In COVID registry, use of IVUS guidance was significant improvement in terms of AMI, and cardiac death and MI. So that the, but it's very hard to interpret the current status because that the in complex lesion, IVUS is used, used and non-complex lesion, IVUS is not used so that the, it's very difficult to prove the, whether it can be an independent predictor or not. But the, anyway, we know that the in complex intervention, IVUS OCT use is, is a mandatory. Another important concept is that the side branch relevance. So this is a comparison between the true versus non-true bifurcation lesion outcome. We know very well that the patient who had a true bifurcation has a worse outcome than non-true, but except only a side branch which is small, so that the, there was interaction according to the side branch reference diameter, so that the small side branch, you cannot make any difference whatever you do with your technique, stent, and drug treatment. So that's the reason why we should focus on large side branch. So last year, I had a chance to show this kind of decision tree models for the uh, prognostically important side branch, so that the, uh, we would like to propose the three different elements, which is the side branch size, 
and the number of diagonal branches and relative dominance among the branches and relative dominance between uh, circumflex and the uh, LAD. And if you cannot have uh, data on size, you can only use uh, these two, diff uh, two, two features, number of branches and the relatively dominance, and you will have around 80% accuracy in predicting the prognostically significant branches. But some may think that it's too complicated, so I just want to follow those rules. Then we need to train, simply train our eyes. So these are the four diagonal branches, which is big, caused that the more than 10% myocardial ischemia. So just let's test our eyes and train our eyes. So this is 15%, this is 11%, 10%, 12%. So all studies and all two studies should be done for these very, very big branches. So finally, in the end, I would like to talk about the risk stratification. So in this study published by Dr. Han, COVID group investigator, found that the presence of side branch occlusion during the procedure was associated with the risk of higher risk of the death MI. So that the pro uh, prediction of this risk and protection is very important. So it is good to know that the predictor of side branch occlusion, so it may be simple, side branch disease severity in terms of both percent diameter stenosis and lesion length, and also uh, by the main branch uh, percent diameter stenosis because it influences the degree of plaque shift and coronal shift. And acute coronal syndrome, which determines the plaque characteristics, is the predictor of side branch occlusion so that the, when you're treating with the patient having this kind of characteristics, you should be very careful. And what is the role of these uh, side branch wiring? So that it's good to see that the, if you see the predictor of side branch recovery after occlusion, this is very important. The only predictor was that the use of jade wire in the side branch. So this uh, represents still the importance of use of protection of the side branch when you are dealing with the uh, two stenting or the bifurcation stenting. So another very important element is that the patient characteristics. So when we are dealing with the predictors and outcomes so that the, we only focus on the using second generation, non-compliant balloon, final kissing balloon, but it is very important to understand the uh, gross risk of the patients. So like in this uh, table, high syntax score, whole uh, disease burden, and pre presence of diabetes is a kind of natural predictor of the higher risk of future event in bifurcation patients. So we should remind this important thing in our daily practice. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, so COBIS registry started with the bifurcation PCI patients since 2004 and are still ongoing with the dedicated QCI co-laboratory, CRO, independent stat team, and event committee. And results of COVID trial expanded our knowledge on bifurcation treatment and improved the patient clinical outcomes. And we hope that the ongoing COVID-3 study can provide more insights on coronary bifurcation lesions and their treatment. Thank you very much for your kind attention. very nice presentation. Sometimes in the Kaplan-Meier curve, you have a bump around six months and then a slope between six months and one year. And then my question is, uh, what was the incidence of angiographic follow-up in these registry? Optional, mandatory, uh, at random? Because obviously it has an impact on the Kaplan-Meier curve. So thank you for the very sharp question. So that the, if you very carefully observe the Kaplan-Meier curve, you can see that bump in uh, COVID-1 and 2 trial. So that the, it wasn't mandatory, but at that time, you know, 2005, 2006, we did lots of uh, follow-up NGO, even with our symptoms. So that caused the bumps. But the, if you see the COVID-3 trial, you cannot see the kind of bump, so that also you know, reflect the changes in trends in terms of the follow-up NGO. So that may be one of the reasons why that the revascularization rate become lower in COVID-3 trial. Did you try some landmark analysis for the late time after one year? Because then the curve seems quite parallel, as a matter of fact. So we haven't done the landmark analysis, but the, I was, we, we will see. Thank you. 
So we thank you very much. We're going to terminate this meeting now. Thank you. And proceed with lunch in the farm. Benjamin, do you have another announcement?